Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, and I'd like to start off by thanking uh, my colleagues, Council Members Levine and Rivera, for holding this joint hearing. We're joined by Council Members Holden, Council Members Eugene, Council Members Traeger, Council Members Barron, Council Member Cohen, Council Member Powers, Council Member Levin, Council Member Amprey Samuel, and I believe that is everyone. Today we'll discuss the city's preparedness for the novel coronavirus and the related disease officially designated COVID-19 by the World Health Organization or the WHO. We expect to hear from several city agencies, including the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the New York City Health and Hospitals, New York City Office of Emergency Management, the Department for the Aging, and the Department of Education, and for members of the public. I am very thankful for the entire administration for being here today. I was just with you all at a press conference just five minutes ago at One Police Plaza. <clears throat> and for all of the work that you have been doing around the clock on this. I am pleased to know that it is an all hands on deck approach to ensure that New Yorkers are as prepared, informed, and safe as possible. And I especially want to thank and recognize our Department of Health Commissioner, Dr. Barbeau, and her entire team at the New York City Health Department, who have been working tirelessly since the beginning of this year to ensure our city is prepared for and responsive to COVID-19. Dr. Barbeau, you've done a great job. The city of New York is lucky to have the best public health officials and health department in the world, and we appreciate you again taking time to come here, especially with everything that has been going on today. <clears throat> Recently, a new coronavirus, which causes a disease named COVID-19, has been detected in almost 100,000 people worldwide. COVID-19 has been making headlines, and there is a lot of misinformation out there. Today, we are here to shine light on the facts, the facts of what people need to know. We want New Yorkers to be prepared, and we want to, we want to address the real fears New Yorkers have, but we want New Yorkers to feel calm because the city is prepared. New York City has handled similar situations before, and we are ready to do it again. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses that cause mild illnesses like a cold to more serious illnesses like different strains of the flu. I want to emphasize that COVID-19 for a large majority of people who become infected presents the same symptoms as a cold or the flu. In fact, as of now, 80% of people with COVID-19 have mild symptoms that resolve on their own without the need for medical intervention. Based on our current understanding, most people who contract COVID-19 will not need hospital care or urgent medical care at all. That being said, we, as, you, as the public should see every single day, are taking this virus very seriously. And some New Yorkers are more vulnerable than others because new information is emerging every day. Today, again, we'll hear from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene about individuals who may be more susceptible to moderate and severe symptoms, including older individuals and those with certain underlying health conditions, and what the city is doing to reach out and support these individuals. We all have a role to play in taking preventative measures to protect ourselves and our vulnerable friends and neighbors against this virus. Not surprisingly, these preventative measures are similar to those recommended for the common cold and the flu. Frequent and thorough hand washing with soap for at least 20 seconds, or using hand sanitizer when necessary, alcohol-based, staying home if we feel sick and covering our coughs and sneezes with a tissue or in our elbow. It is crucial for every single person who has a fever, cough, and or shortness of breath to contact their doctor or health provider or call through on one to get connected to care. There are also things that New Yorkers should not do at this time, such as boycotting or avoiding certain businesses, avoiding public public spaces, hoarding important uh, medical equipment, such as face masks or cleaning supplies. If they are healthy, this can hurt other New Yorkers who may actually need those supplies right now. 
New Yorkers can also rest assured knowing that every single person can receive medical care regardless of their insurance status, their income or immigration status. If you are feeling unwell and you have any questions, again, you should call 311 and request that help. Anyone without health insurance can receive free and low-cost care at our public hospital system, and I'm glad that Dr. Katz is here as well. I want to encourage all New Yorkers to support their friends, neighbors, and colleagues by educating themselves against misinformation, especially misinformation that perpetuates panic or bias. In particular, we have seen examples of anti-Asian racism and anti-Semitism in connection with the spread of this virus. We as a city, as I've said before, will not stand for actions fueled by fear-mongering or racism. At moments like this, we must stand alongside our friends and neighbors and do all we can to protect one another. As a reminder, if you're being harassed due to your race, ethnicity, religion, nation of origin, or other identities, or you're a witness to such acts, you can report such discrimination and harassment to the New York City Commission on Human Rights by calling through on one. I'm also troubled by uh, some of the ways that we have seen, I think, irresponsible folks uh, that have been commenting on this who have perpetuated the troubling and fear-mongering messages and uh, tried to create public panic around this when we're trying to handle this in a sober, factual, scientific way. Let's focus on public health. Let's make sure that our messaging resonates with the facts shared by true public health experts, such as members of our health department, of our health and hospital system, of the World Health Organization. That's who we should be listening to. New Yorkers can also th call through on one if they face retaliation from their employer or if they need to take sick time and they have questions. As a reminder, the city mandates most employers to provide paid sick leave and no one should feel pressured to go to work if they are not feeling well. Our city is strong, resilient, and equipped with some of the best hospitals and medical providers in the world. We are ready to handle anything, including COVID-19. But I am proud of the work we have done so far. I look forward to discussing uh, this preparedness in greater detail. Before I turn it over to the co-chairs who are co-chairing this hearing, uh, I just want to uh, say that uh, today's hearing for the members who are here, for all the members who are here, we've also been joined by Council Members Reynoso, Ayala, and Maisel. Uh, today is about us getting facts. Today is about us handling this in a sober, thoughtful way. Now, people are rightfully concerned. People are rightfully anxious. It's okay to ask questions in that regard, but let's not move towards hyperbole. Let's not do things that are going to cause panic and scare people. Let's focus on what the city's doing to be prepared. If there are questions about what we have done so far, uh, those are reasonable questions that people should ask. Uh, but I wanna just set the tone for this hearing today, that today is us uh, trying to get facts out there to the public, to our constituents who are calling our local council member offices with questions and concerns and to hear it from some of the main individuals who have been handling the response. Um, Deputy Commissioner Dimitri Doxalakis uh, couldn't be here today because he's dealing with this. He was supposed to be here. And Commissioner Criswell from OEM was supposed to be here, but she couldn't be here because they are both literally this moment uh, dealing with the city's response. Though in the midst of that, Dr. Barbeau, Dr. Katz, Chancellor Carranza, and other folks from the administration are here because they thought it was important to be at this hearing today to continue to reassure the public about what we have done so far, what we are doing in the future, and how we need to think of this moving forward. So I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate the interest from the council members in being here today. And with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Council Member Levine, the chair of the Council's Committee on Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that. Very important guidelines on our goals in the hearing today. As you said, I am Mark Levine, chair of the City Council's Health Committee. And uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, and of course, uh, my colleague, Councilmember Rivera, <clears throat> for chairing this hearing with me today. I want to thank the administration, all of you, for joining us today. And I, too, want to single out the Health Department and uh, you, Dr. D Barbeau, our commissioner, and your team for working around the clock. We are very lucky to have world-class public health professionals in charge right now. Um, and we want the public to know that, that they should have confidence in you and your leadership. To successfully battle any public health crisis, certainly one on the scale of coronavirus or COVID-19, 
It is critical that the public be armed with accurate information from trustworthy sources. And thus the goal of this hearing is to focus on the facts, on the science, to highlight the city's preparedness, to dispel mis misinformation, and to quell unwarranted fears that can lead to needless and even harmful actions by the public. So, some facts. 80% of those who contract COVID-19 will in fact experience only light symptoms, roughly akin to a cold, and not requiring medical treatment. On the other extreme, 14% of patients do experience severe disease, and approximately 5% of patients will become critically ill, likely requiring hospitalization with fatalities and some smaller portion of cases. The majority of those most seriously affected are older individuals. In fact, children are the least vulnerable age group. And many of those with the most serious medical repercussions from COVID-19 have pre-existing medical conditions, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hepatitis B, chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease, chronic kidney diseases, and cancer. More facts. There is no recommendation at this time, repeat, no recommendation at this time for New Yorkers to limit their travel within the city, to avoid public gatherings and public transportation, or to change anything about where they obtain their food or prepare it. And there is no need and no excuse for avoiding any neighborhood in the city, in particular Chinatown and other Asian communities, yes. which are now struggling in the face of a crippling economic blow brought on by the unfunded, unfounded shunning of their businesses by the public. There's no recommendation for anyone to wear, to wear a mask if they are not sick or had not been instructed to do so by a medical provider. Nor, however, should anyone be targeted for harassment if they do choose to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And given that the confirmed cases in New York so far have been concentrated in the Jewish community, in a pre-existing climate of rising anti-Semitism, oh. we must fiercely oppose any further attempt to scapegoat or stigmatize Jewish New Yorkers or any other group in this city affected or presumed to be affected by this virus. This hearing is about helping New Yorkers understand the roles we all have to play in getting through this crisis. It's about understanding the steps our health department and other city agencies are taking to protect New Yorkers and to prepare for a more serious turn in this crisis. It's about ensuring we have adequate resources and plans in place should the most serious scenarios come to pass. I firmly believe that our city government is up to this challenge. I know our city is up to this challenge. And I very much look forward to the discussion ahead. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague who's co-chairing, Council Member Carlina Rivera. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals, and I'd like to start off by thanking my colleague, Speaker Johnson, and Council Member Levine for chairing this hearing with me today. As the Speaker and Council Member Levine discuss, we will be examining the city's preparedness for COVID-19. The city's hospitals are a key partner in our efforts to prepare for COVID-19. New York City is home to some of the country's most renowned hospital systems, and this includes our public hospital system, H&H. H&H's 11 acute care hospitals and various other medical facilities are located throughout our city and serve many of our residents who rely on Medicaid or are uninsured. H&H never turns anyone away who is seeking care. As the speaker highlighted, every person in New York City, regardless of their ability to pay or their immigration status, can receive care at H&H. This includes individuals who seek medical care because of COVID-19 symptoms. And I want to encourage all individuals who are experiencing flu-like symptoms to contact their doctor or 311 to get the medical advice and services they need 
and to know that they can rely on H&H &H and other hospitals to receive care. I am grateful to have H&H &H present here today so we can learn more about their preparation efforts. Recent reports state that our city's hospitals already have the capacity to treat 1,200 people for COVID-19 without disrupting other needed medical care. I'd like to learn more about where these beds are located, how many are within H&H &H facilities, how many are within voluntary hospitals, and what else H&H &H has done pre to prepare for the spread of the virus. I'd also like to hear more about the protocols already in place to screen and treat patients, as well as precautionary measures taken by staff when treating patients. Our medical providers can be vulnerable during such outbreaks, and I am sure that we are doing all we can to protect them from exposure. I am pleased that we are also joined by the Greater New York Hospital Association, who can speak to the efforts of our city's voluntary hospitals. We already know that the city's voluntary hospitals have provided care to the few New Yorkers with the virus. I look forward to learning more about their protocols and the measures they have taken to ensure that we can effectively treat and prevent the spread of COVID-19. As the speaker mentioned, the spread of COVID-19 is occurring simultaneously with efforts by the federal government to scare our immigrant communities. Just last week, we held a joint hearing with the Committee on Immigration regarding increased ICE activity in New York City. I want to again emphasize that no matter who you are, where you were born, your immigration status, you are able to get health care in New York City. We know that particular individuals are more susceptible to moderate or severe symptoms, those who are older and those with chronic health conditions. With these statistics in mind, the response to COVID-19 must include the examination of health inequities and reinforcement of healthcare access and care for those within populations that are disproportionately impacted. I look forward to discussing the city's outreach and efforts during our hearing today. Y quiero enfatizar que no importa quién seas, dónde naciste o tu estatus migratorio en Nueva York puedes acceder a servicios de salud Y hoy destacaremos los hechos y esperamos disipar información errónea y peligrosa que puede resultar en acciones de riesgo o innecesarios. Today, we are highlighting the facts. The fact is, our city's hospital systems have effectively handled numerous outbreaks before, including measles and Ebola. They have been preparing for COVID-19 for months. They have already have plans in place, and today we will learn more about those plans. Every New Yorker should feel confident that they can rely on our city's hospital systems, as well as our health department. I want to thank all of our public employees, from the person cleaning our schools, to the public hospital nurse, to our emergency fire and police services, for all the work that they are doing to keep our city safe. Thank you all for attending today, and I look forward to highlighting the relevant facts while dispelling dangerous misinformation, which can result in unnecessary and dangerous actions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera, and I want to quickly turn it over for some brief opening remarks. Even though this is a joint hearing between the Health Committee and the Hospital Committee, this uh, we do have the Chancellor here today, and I want to allow the Chair of our Education Committee, Mark Traeger, to make some brief opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to just also just thank you, Mr. Speaker, and your office, who has been extremely responsive uh, to my office and to issues that we have raised. I want to also just publicly uh, acknowledge and thank the Chancellor and his team in his office uh, with the speed of responsiveness to my office and to the questions. I, I do want to publicly thank you for that, Mr. Chancellor, and, and, and your team. So my name is Councilmember Mark Traeger. I want to thank the, uh, the Speaker, Chair Levine, Chair Rivera, for holding this very important hearing. And thank you all uh, to all the agencies that are here to testify and to answer questions. As chair of the Education Committee, I want to take a few moments to speak directly to parents in our school uh, communities. We have been hearing from you, and we understand that you are concerned about your children's well-being. But based on what we know right now, the virus appears to be affecting school-aged children at lower rates, and the symptoms are still relatively mild. Still, we understand that when it comes to our kids, we must be prepared and must do everything we can to keep them safe and supported. That is why the Department of Education has taken measures to reassure students, staff, and parents. 
Schools are being deep cleaned twice per week using standard, strong uh, cleaning products commonly used against viruses. I would respectfully request that the DOE ensure that custodial and maintenance staff have access to overtime as needed to ensure that there is ample time for deep cleaning and preventative maintenance. DOE has sent a memorandum to custodial staff reminding them of cleaning protocols, instructing them to pick up additional cleaning supplies, including supplies that are designed to kill the virus, and will be sending a survey to custodians asking them whether they have enough supplies to last at least 30 days. And to emphasize the importance of staying home if you feel ill, DOE has said that it will suspend its policy of considering absences for the purposes of middle and high school admissions for next year's admission cycle. I want to note that this is a conversation that must continue beyond this, this outbreak. Uh, additionally, DOE has been in contact with early, child, early education centers and private schools in the city uh, to share cleaning protocols, collaborate on best practices, and offer assistance obtaining cleaning supplies. And to just uh, build on the speakers and the chair's remarks, there is zero room, zero tolerance for xenophobia, hatred, bullying of any kind in our school system as well. And I'm sure the chancellor would, uh, will echo that and reinforce those uh, remarks as well. Zero room, zero tolerance for hate. Because it's my belief that the virus of misinformation and the virus of hate are far more dangerous than the virus itself. So we're going to hear more today from DOE about its plans, including learning more about its coordination with the health department. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues in the administration to combat this virus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to uh, read the names of the folks that uh, Dr. Barbeau is going to be the one who delivers a testimony today for the entire administration and all of the agencies that are represented. But we have a bunch of folks that may actually uh, have questions asked of them. So I'm going to read the names, and then the uh, council is going to administer the oath to you. We have Dr. Arxiris Barbeau, the Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We have Dr. Mitchell Katz, the President and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals. We have Richard Carranza, the Chancellor at the Department of Education. We have Michelle Allen, Doctor, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals. We have Andrew DeMora from the Office of Emergency Management. We have Guillermo Cruz from the New York City Department for the Aging. We have, I uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name or if your handwriting is not very good, uh, Benjamin Strong uh, from DIFTA as well. And we have from DIFTA, Azela Khalili, uh, a deputy commissioner at the Department for the Aging. So if all of you would please raise your right hand and the, and the council will administer the oath. Mr. Speaker. Could we just, uh, friendly amendment, Ursulina Ramirez? Yes, Ursulina, I apologize. Uh, Ursulina as well, from the DOE. Ursulina Ramirez. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, or these committees, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbeau. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, Chairs Levine and Rivera, and members of the committee. I am Oxidis Barbeau, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I am joined by colleagues from New York City Emergency Management, New York City Health and Hospitals, Department of Education, and Department for the Aging. I will testify today on the city's response to the 2019 novel coronavirus, or COVID-19. COVID-19 COVID is a respiratory infection. Reported illnesses have ranged from asymptomatic to mild to severely ill, and symptoms can include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. It can spread between people who are in close, regular contact with one another, and through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes in close contact with others. So while 80% of cases have been classified as mild, the virus can be severe and even fatal. Across the world and here in the United States, the COVID-19 outbreak is rapidly changing. In New York City, 33 individuals have been tested for the COVID-19. Um, three individuals have tested positive, and actually this is an indication of how quickly things change. Um, as of this morning, we had 35 individuals, four individuals have tested positive, and we have uh, six results that are pending. These include both travel-acquired infections, 
and community-acquired infections. Currently, those at greatest risk of infection are persons who have had prolonged and unprotected close contact with a patient with confirmed COVID-19 who is symptomatic, and those with recent travel to affected geographic regions with widespread or sustained community transmission or contact with anyone with confirmed COVID-19 within 14 days. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has issued clinical guidance for the national response for, to COVID-19. This week, the CDC expanded the guidance for healthcare providers so anyone can be tested for COVID-19 regardless of <clears throat> symptoms, exposure, or travel history at the discretion of the clinical provider. Viruses don't respect borders, and this broader definition will help us cast a wider net to detect the virus in our city. I want to be very clear. We expect the number of cases under investigation to grow. We want New Yorkers to be prepared and vigilant, but not alarmed. We're going to confront this with transparency, full information, and science-based strategies that help us protect people. I want to emphasize the risk to New Yorkers of contracting COVID-19 since the beginning has been low, but as we are seeing community transmission, we're really paying very close attention to that. The important thing is for New Yorkers to remain vigilant. New York City has rapidly mobilized to respond to this outbreak, working closely with our state and federal partners. Within the city, the health department is in constant communication with our sister agencies. I'm happy to report that our public health laboratory can now test for COVID-19. This means that we can currently test specimens as soon as we get them and get results back in a matter of hours, not days. We also began implementing an early detection system at three health systems, including H&H, NYU, and New York Presbyterian, to obtain high quality data and information about COVID-19, its prevalence and its transmission in the community. We lowered the threshold for testing to people who may have been missed by previous CDC guidance. Since implementing this change, we have detected local transmission in New York City. That means person-to-person -person spread in our community that is not linked to travel abroad. Quick detection is vital to our ability to appropriately isolate patients, identify close contacts, and ultimately halt further transmission. The healthcare system is ready to accept patients. There are nearly 20,000 hospital beds all throughout New York City, and of these, over 1,200 are at, <coughs> excuse me, at the highest level of isolation. Excuse me. The H and H Emergency Operations Center is activated to virtually monitor the outbreak and provide support to all sites as needed and system leadership is in constant communication with local, state, and federal public health partners. All h, &H sites have surge management plans, in, which include using traditional and non-traditional spaces to treat patients, including over 300 negative pressure rooms. Frontline h, &H staff have up-to-date clinical information, including infection prevention and control, personal protective equipment usage and practices, instructions on specimen collection, and in-service trainings on using personal protective gear. h, &H also has embedded travel screening into the electronic health record system to ensure that any patient walking into one of its facilities is promptly identified and isolated. The health department activated our incident command system to respond to COVID-19 on January 31st, and the city situation room at NYC Emergency Management, or NYSEM, activated on February 1st. NYSEM has engaged close to 800 organizations that are the city's quote unquote partners in preparedness for employees, services, and facilities 
for emergencies and conducted multiple calls with our private sector partners, which encompasses building owners and managers, the real estate industry, university and independent schools, as well as airlines. NISOM is executing practice plans and have recently hosted two tabletop exercises that brought together our leading health experts and officials from dozens of city agencies to rehearse citywide coordinated responses. They are also closely monitoring the supply chain and working with the Department of Citywide and Administrative Services to plan for mitigating the effects of any disruptions to agency resource needs. In recent weeks, the city has accelerated our efforts to disseminate critical information to healthcare providers, community organizations, and other partners and the public. NISIM, along with multiple city agency partners, opened the Joint Information Center on Tuesday. The health department and our sister agencies, including Department for the Aging, have also been working to create and distribute educational messaging in multiple languages to provide critical information for the public about COVID-19, including information on protective measures, common symptoms, criteria for testing, and what to do if they feel unwell. Yesterday, we announced a Subway digital and multimedia ad campaign encouraging hygiene and seeking care when symptomatic. The health department has issued guidance and FAQ documents for healthcare professionals across New York City to provide up-to-date information on COVID-19, including the latest information on the prevalence of the virus, guidelines for testing and treatment, and recent national and international guidance. We established a provider call center to make sure that healthcare workers can access the latest information and are co-hosting weekly provider conferences, excuse me, weekly provider conference calls with the state health department. The health department is also working closely with the Department of Education and communicating updated guidance to principals and families. DOE increased deep cleanings to two times per week and has ensured all 1,800 schools have adequate hygiene and cleaning materials. The most important message we can communicate to parents is that if your child is sick, they should stay home from school. We are working with community partners to reach their constituencies with these facts and learn what they are hearing from excuse me, and learn what they are hearing from people in the community. If you or your constituents are looking for the latest information regarding COVID-19, please visit the Health Department website or call 311. In the coming weeks, we may call for greater cooperation from the public, depending on the number of people affected by COVID-19 and the severity of illness we experience in our city. For now, New Yorkers should practice the same precautions as cold and flu season. Get a flu shot, it's not too late. Frequently wash hands with soap and water, or if you're not close to a water source, use alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your face and cover your mouth and nose if you cough or sneeze. If you have fever, cough, and or shortness of breath, and recently traveled to an area with ongoing spread of coronavirus, or have been in close contact with someone who has recently traveled to any of the affected areas, call your doctor, go to your doctor, don't delay. If you have these symptoms but no relevant travel history, stay home and call your doctor. As we confront this emerging outbreak, we need to separate facts from fear and guard against stigma. I want to be clear, this is about a virus, not about a group of people. There is no excuse for anyone to discriminate or stigmatize anyone. I urge all New Yorkers to continue to live their lives as usual, practice good hand hygiene, and stay vigilant so together we can stop the spread of this virus. Thank you to Speaker Johnson, Chairs Levine, and Rivera, and the City Council for their partnership in this work. I am happy to answer questions, as I am sure my fellow panelists are.
Thank you, Dr. Barbeau. Uh, I know your testimony wasn't exactly how we got it because this has been an evolving situation. So you all were changing the testimony up until the last minute and I appreciate uh, everything that you said. I also wanna uh, just uh, preface our questions that we're gonna ask by saying, uh, we know the answers to some of these questions already, but I think it's important that we actually get the answers on the record. Uh, people are watching since the media is here, uh, even though some of the questions we might ask may seem rudimentary or basic. I think it's important given the misinformation that we're seeing to ask even the most basic questions and to have our trusted health professionals and providers to answer those questions. So the first question I wanna ask is, and you may have, uh, you addressed this uh, in your testimony, uh, how is COVID-19 spread? So COVID-19 is a, what we call a respiratory virus and it is a new strain with an exist, within an existing family of viruses. And so the way that it is spread is when someone who has the virus and is infected with it, coughs, sneezes to, some, to someone else, and that person then takes their hands, puts them in their mouth, puts them in their eyes, and that's where the virus comes into the body. This is not like measles, where if someone with the measles is in a room, leaves two hours later, you know, 10 people who haven't been vaccinated with the measles come into the room, can actually get the measles very easily. Nine out of 10 of them will get it. This is a situation where an individual with coronavirus can spread the virus, but it is through very, um, clear mechanisms that I just described. It's not a casual contact sort of thing. So then uh, if you could talk, uh, you talked earlier today at the press conference, uh, and if you could explain what community spread means uh, for folks that may not know what that means, and that is causing some concern amongst folks. If you could talk about the community spread that we've seen thus far, what that means, and what New Yorkers should think about that as it relates to how COVID-19 can be spread? So that's a really important question, and thank you for that. At the beginning of this outbreak, this worldwide outbreak, the information to New Yorkers and to Americans was that the risk was based on travel. And so we've become accustomed to saying symptoms of fever, cough, shortness of breath, and travel were the primary risks. Initially it was China, and then it moved to Iran, Italy, South Korea, Japan. Virtually, there's almost 80 countries throughout the world that have coronavirus. When we talk about community spread, which in its simplest form simply means person-to-person -person spread in the community, what we're actually trying to convey is that there's no longer that travel nexus. It means that the virus is in our community and that we can't just go by travel. It's an important component, but we're now moving into a situation where we have loosened our testing requirements so that travel is no longer uh, a reason why people are being excluded for treatment. So community transmission is a very important piece of information. And some of the confirmed cases that were announced today and have been announced in the last couple of days, uh, there was no nexus to travel to the countries that have been identified. And in some of the instances, we don't know at this point, though the disease detectives at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is, are looking into this, we don't know of a nexus of some folks even being in contact with folks that had been in those countries, is that correct? So currently, of the four individuals who have tested positive in New York City, only one of them has a travel nexus. Um, and so the other three, we have not been able to identify any uh, direct uh, con uh, contact. And so that is a really important point to emphasize that we need New Yorkers to practice with uh, diligence, good hand hygiene, and most importantly, if they're feeling sick and they have traveled to one of these countries, stay home. Don't send your children home. Talk to your doctor. We're making it as easy as possible to get tested. So I just want to be clear. This is, a, and I don't say this in, in any way, 
uh, to exaggerate the moment that we're in, but to provide some context, this is an evolving situation. Day to day, the Department of Health and the other city agencies, in conjunction with the state of New York and our federal partners in looking at what's happening around the world with the World Health Organization, you all make a determination today based off of the number of people who are being tested, based off of the number of positive tests that have come back. And again, at this point, the number is only four in New York City, and the, there have been more than 30 people who have been tested. You all make a determination day to day. This is what we're alerting the public to. Here are the facts. Here's how we're being transparent. I think there are some New Yorkers, I think it's important to say this, who, because of a lot of the media attention around it, because, of course, parents are extraordinarily concerned about their children, because seniors have been affected uh, in a much greater way than other folks because of their particular vulnerability as it relates to COVID-19. Because of that, some New Yorkers have thought to themselves, is it okay to get on the subway? Is it okay to go to my uh, child's uh, dance recital? Is it okay to go to these type of things? And Dr. Barbeau, for New Yorkers that are thinking in that way, I would love for you to sort of tell them what the, the guidance could change at some point, but the current guidance today is what? From the very beginning, we have been encouraging New Yorkers to go about their daily lives, but to practice vigilance. And so we want New Yorkers to use the subway, to go to the theater, to go to gatherings, to go to banquet halls and celebrate life. But we also want New Yorkers to pay attention, to check out our website, nyc.gov forward slash health for, as you started this hearing, for the facts and not give in to the fear that's being perpetrated across the internet, across social media, based on inaccuracies. And so it's important to note that also from the very beginning, we've been transparent to say, this is an evolving situation. The scientific community is learning every day about the science of the virus, and that beyond that, we're learning every day about the transmission, and that what guidance we are giving from the beginning, the hand hygiene guidance, will carry through whether we remain in this particular status of transmission or whether think to whenever things change. And so the important message is that um, we have been very careful not to over sort of dramatize the situation because this is a time for vigilance, not for panic. But we want New Yorkers to know all the information. And when you spoke in your testimony about the NISM, the New York City uh, Office of Emergency Management uh, coordinated uh, group of folks, when you talked about the two tabletop exercises that have been done, just to be clear to New Yorkers in sort of layperson's terms, what that means is that the city sketches out different potentially cascading scenarios, not to freak people out, but to ensure that we're prepared, that if the situation does change from the moment that we're in, if other additional measures do need to be taken, uh, that we have already played those scenarios out uh, and we have a coordinated response. So we are always sort of planning ahead of the curve for a potentially worst case scenario, even though it's not the scenario we're in right now. From the very beginning, our posture has, and I'll start and you can uh, amplify, our posture has been that we were gonna be as aggressive as possible to deploy all the tools at our disposal, but only put them into action when the situation called for it. And so, as you say, in terms of our advanced planning, we're, from the very beginning, we're not taking anything for granted. We're not saying, oh, it's not gonna come here, oh, it's gonna be mild. We are running through scenarios so that if and when we hit certain thresholds, we've already planned for that. We've got the resources that we need, we've got the uh, chains in line so that when and if things need to be deployed, we're ready. And, and just before OEM goes, uh, and I want you to answer the question, but before, uh, just to, to, uh, to get to sort of the heart of the matter, 
Uh, you believe, Dr. Barbeau, in being in all of these meetings and not getting much sleep over the past many weeks because of how involved you've been in responding to this and being one of the public faces associated with the city's response. Uh, you, are, of course, are in charge of our health department, but in working with your other commissioners, with the chancellor, with the deputy mayors, with the state health commissioner, being in touch with the uh, folks at the uh, CDC and other partners, WHO, do you believe right now that the city is prepared? Without a doubt, the city is prepared. And I will also add that we are in regular communication with our state partners and with our federal partners. You know, I've been a part of the health department for a number of years, and I would have to say that the level of coordination and, and cooperation between us and our state counterparts has never been stronger. And we are focused on ensuring that we keep New Yorkers, whether they live in the city or outside of the city, are always safe. I just wanted to expand. We've only not- Tell us your name. Uh, Andy Diamora from Emergency Management. Good afternoon. Um, not just uh, with the two, we've been doing these on a, a continuing basis and we'll continue the to- The tabletop exercise. That is correct. We're calling it like a war, war room uh, type situation. Situation working. room. Yeah, so the mayor has been involved fully with his staff. In fact, we've also had put planning groups together with uh, all city agencies to come in. We have opened up an emergency operations center in a planning cell to really lean forward to look at those scenarios uh, as we go into uh, this prolonged. I just have a couple more questions, and I'm going to turn it over to the co-chairs, and then we're going to have members here. We're going to put the members on a clock because these folks can't be here all day because they have to get back to actually dealing with the situation at hand. So we have them for a limited amount of time. Uh, Dr. Barbeau, if you could just be a little more specific, because I think council members have some concerns, and I've heard it from the public as well, about what uh, if you can get this through casual contact. What I mean by that is... Uh, if you are on the subway with someone who has it and, you know, you're all at the other end of the car uh, and they sneeze or cough, uh, could you get it? Uh, I think people want a, a little more specificity about what the risk is right now because I think there is some concern uh, around, around that, the answer to that question. It's unlikely that someone would contract COVID-19 from being in the subway, from being on a bus, being on public transportation. Um, the likelihood of someone contracting COVID-19 is much higher if they live in the same household with someone. Um, other uh, scenarios where people would be at higher risk are, you know, we're always concerned about our healthcare workers and ensuring that they have the proper protective equipment to ensure that when they are taking care of patients, they're not putting themselves at additional risks. So from the very beginning, we've been telling New Yorkers to use the subway, use public transportation. We are not in a situation where casual contact has been the reason why it's exploded across the world. Currently, we've got close to 100,000 people throughout the world that have been infected with COVID-19. So j j just so, so to be clear, the, the four folks that have been identified as testing positive right now, we tested additional people from universes that through the disease detectives found to have been in close contact with them. You had the family members, uh, for the family that lives in Westchester, where the father worked in New York City. And then you did tests to people who worked at that law firm. Yes. We have did tests for the roommates and friends of the son who went to university. In the, we did tests on those folks. For the folks that uh, were tested, did any of those tests at this point come back positive where they weren't living in the same household, but they were at work with the person, they were in the same car as the person. Have any of those tests come back positive at this point? So the, the tests that have come back positive have been uh, individuals that lived in the same household yes. with the affected individual. Uh, in the case, for example, of the son of the gentleman who's currently still in the hospital, we tested his roommate and his best friend. They were negative. Both negative. Exactly. We've tested the coworkers in the law firm. They've all been negative. All negative. All negative. 
Very helpful. Uh, I want to ask one question of the chancellor, and then I'm going to, uh, and the one of Dr. Katz, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, to the co-chairs. Um, uh, chancellor Carranza, at this moment in time, out of the 1.1 million uh, public school children, we say public school children, we're including charter schools, we're including all of the schools that the Department of Education has oversight over. We don't have a single positive test or even at this point, someone who we are considering symptomatic of a child in the schools right now. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Speaker. So we have no students that are being excluded or quarantined or testing positive. We have no students from New York City. None. And, and the communication that DOE has put in place uh, over the last few weeks, especially over the last few days, is uh, if you could describe it on how DOE right now is disseminating information, again, factual information, to uh, parents, to school communities, to teachers, to people that work in the schools at all levels, whether they work in the cafeteria. Uh, wh what is the communication system right now to get facts out? And if, again, things change over the course of the days and weeks ahead, what does that communication system look like as it relates to our public school communities, children, and parents? So, Mr. Speaker, I think one of the most uh, powerful things that I would like people to leave here with is what Dr. Barbeau has spoken about, that this, uh, this virus uh, doesn't seem to like kids, thank goodness. Uh, but what we've been doing, because of the changing nature of the guidance, we, we are communicating almost on a daily basis with all of our uh, employee groups. The, the major mode of communication currently is we're backpacking information home at the, at the lower grades. Uh, we are also posting the information on the school websites, our website. Uh, we are giving information to schools that they send home to their students and, and, and parents. Um, today, I sent uh, communication and guidelines to all 152,000 employees in the DOE. Uh, we also sent uh, additional guidance today, updated guidance to principals on a number of things. Uh, everything from cleaning protocols to uh, identifying students that may present some symptoms. Uh, I am uh, having tomorrow a webinar with all 1,800 principals. Uh, which is mandatory, where we will also have our partners from the Department of Health that will go through the guidance and answer any questions principals have. We have really done what we can to make sure everyone understands that this is a priority and this is a high priority. Uh, we will continue as information becomes more current, as guidance becomes more current, we will also continue to communicate that directly through our schools to our parents. Uh, and the reason we're uh, adopting the school delivery method as well as others, but the school delivery method is that schools have their most direct way of communicating with their parent communities. And it looks a little different in, in different schools, so we're, we're utilizing that methodology to get information to our families. Thank you, Chancellor. I'm sure there are gonna be more questions for you. A short last question to Dr. Katz, then I'm gonna turn it over to Councilmember Levine and then I believe Councilmember Rivera. Uh, Dr. Katz, I know, you, of course, you're in charge of our public hospital system uh, here, uh, but there has been, as Dr. Barbeau testified, of course, conversations with the other hospitals outside of the system that you run. At this moment right now, uh, and if things, again, not to exaggerate, not to come up with worst case scenarios, but from a planning perspective, if things changed a little bit and we saw a, a, a jump in infections here in New York City that required not just people quarantining in their home and staying in their home, but actually a significant number of older adults or people with, uh, with chronic conditions actually needed to be hospitalized, you believe right now we have the capacity to deal with a situation like that here in New York City from a hospital bed perspective, from a medical staff perspective, from a supply perspective, from all those perspectives, you feel like we're in a good, do you feel like we're in a good position right now? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Dr. Mitch Katz, uh, CEO of Health and Hospitals, yes. Uh, health and hospitals as well as the, the private hospital systems, we practice specifically on what we would each do if 100 more people came to us in respiratory distress. Um, every hospital as part of its disaster plan knows that they're going to activate 
their center of emergency, and they're going to, there is a set protocol that all hospitals train on that begins with things like we're canceling elective surgeries, we're closing clinics for people who are not sick. All of the resources are moving into the hospital. Okay, do we have enough hospital beds? If we don't have enough hospital beds, what are the next spaces in the hospital that, would you, that we would use? So we at Health and Hospitals, and I know in the greater New York voluntary sector as well, we actively uh, practice how we're going to do that and are prepared. And uh, in, in the city of New York, when the President of the United States or any President at a given time comes to New York City, the designated hospital in case of an emergency for that President is which hospital? It is Bellevue Hospital and uh, also Elmhurst, if it's closer to there, two public hospitals. And good time to remind people that it was Bellevue that successfully resuscitated someone with Ebola, the only hospital in all of New York that took care of someone successfully who, who recovered from Ebola. Thank you, Dr. Katz. I want to turn it over to Chair Levine. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. By far the most common question I get from constituents concerns the availability of testing and just who should get tested. This has been something of a moving target. Could you explain to us, as of today, what is the criteria for who could and who should be tested in New York City? Absolutely. Um, and I think it's a very sort of important point to note that those criteria have been evolving over time as the country has been learning how the virus is behaving. Initially, it was limited to people who had traveled to a specific region within China, then it was expanded. And I think the important thing is right now where we are is that if an individual um, has traveled to any of the affected countries and are symptomatic, we wanna test them. If someone has had contact with someone who is sick with COVID, obviously we want to test them. If someone is not feeling well and has concerns about that they might have come in contact with someone, we're now being that permissive as well. So the point here is that we are we have been pushing the federal government to loosen those restrictions. And I think now we're at a point where um, individuals who have concerns can call 311, they can call their doctor, they can go to an H&H &H facility, they can go to a number of different places around the city to have specimens collected. Those tests currently are done at the public health laboratory. Our hope is that um, very soon H&H &H will be do able to do those tests, as well as commercial labs. So the testing capacity across the city will be increasing, hopefully, very shortly. So just to clarify, if someone is not feeling well, right. they haven't been out of the country, they've had no known contact with a confirmed case, the first move is, of course, to call your provider exactly. before you go into a clinic or an ER so they can tell you where to go and how to react, and they can prepare for you if you do need to arrive. Um, presumably then it's the call of the provider who could say there's no other logical explanation for this person's illness. They can call your provider helpline and access a test in that case, correct? And that's a very important point. We don't want to take the provider's clinical judgment out of this. So someone may be presenting with fever for a whole host of reasons, but it's up to the provider's clinical judgment to determine whether that person does indeed need a test for COVID-19. They would then contact us and we would start that process. So given that criteria, which has been expanded, um, I'm somewhat surprised we haven't seen more testing, but w what is the number of tests we're performing per day? How many have we done in the last 24 hours, if you know that number? So we've got 35 people that have been tested. Uh, we anticipate that every single day we will see more and more New Yorkers being tested, so that number will increase um, fairly quickly. I don't have a good sense of, of what that um, trajectory will look like. Um, the important thing to note is that 
We are also working with our hospital partners so that if someone with pneumonia that isn't getting better and doesn't have any other reason for why their pneumonia is not getting better, um, independent of travel, we are testing those individuals as well. And again, it's, it's a, an opportunity uh, not to take anything for granted, discount someone's symptoms because they haven't traveled. What we now know is that when we have person-to-person -person spread in a community, we want to have the availability of more testing. Were you going to say something, Dr. If I can just add, uh, clinically, it's important that people, both uh, patients and providers, understand the first step in somebody who is sick uh, where there wasn't a nexus would be to test for other viruses that are circulating around, uh, such as influenza uh, and respiratory of other respiratory viruses and bacteria viruses. So the, the usual sequence would be a person would say, uh, they're, they're not feeling well, they would call their doctor, and their doctor would test them for things that at this moment would be much more likely um, than that they had coronavirus. And then if all of those tests came negative and I was the clinician, then I would call my colleagues at the Department of Health and Mental Health and say, I have someone with suggestive symptoms and I've tested them already and they don't have influenza and I'm very concerned therefore about them. And that's a really important addition, thank you, Dr. Katz, because I want to remind New Yorkers that we're in the middle of a really bad flu season, and um, I don't want that to go unnoticed. I think in any other year, we would be drawing attention to the fact that we're seeing lots and lots of New Yorkers coming into hospitals with the flu. And again, I want to take every opportunity to remind New Yorkers it's not too late to get the flu vaccine. Part of the reason also is I don't want New Yorkers to be in a situation where they may develop fever and a cough and go through the anxiety of wondering whether they have COVID-19 when in reality they've got the flu. And so by how many people How many people get the flu in New York City every single year? We have, well, let me start with a more dramatic <clears throat> sort of number, which is uh, Anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 New Yorkers die from the flu on an annual basis. And that's a sober Let's just number. repeat that. 1,000 to 2,000 on average New die. Yorkers die Every from year. influenza. The, from a preventable illness that has a very simple vaccine. And so we need to take that really seriously. There are thousands of people who end up hospitalized unnecessarily. What I always say is the flu vaccine can make the difference between a couple of days on the couch or a couple of days in the hospital. And so that's a very important piece of information that I don't want to get lost. How many people do, do you know, Dr. Barbo, get the flu every year in New York City? I, uh, is it over 100,000 New Yorkers that may get the flu? Do we know what the number is? You know, I usually have that number at the top of my okay. head, but I'm blanking. You, I, I understand why you've been working nonstop. I think the number, the reason why I'm saying this is a very, very significant number of people uh, get the flu because if the mortality rate is pretty low for influenza, uh, the number is probably a significant number, and, and I think it's important. We don't want to minimize the anxiety and fear the public has right now, but we also want to be factual, again, about where things stand compared to what we're already dealing with. Yes. Okay, Chair. Absolutely. Um, this is not a hearing on the flu, but it's important to remind New Yorkers that I think one-third of New Yorkers fail to get their flu shot on an annual basis, and um, uh, that's really uh, unhelpful to public health, so we do want to encourage people to get their shot. I've been handed uh, information that looks like there are, uh, well, these are national numbers, but that there are 310,000 hospitalizations from the flu annually. Uh, that doesn't count more mild cases. That's national, but pretty extensive problem. It's likely that we're going to need to expand the number of tests we offer today from a few dozen potentially to many more than that. What's our current capacity for testing out of the New York City Public Health Lab? So currently we have the capacity to test 1,000 individuals. 
And um, beyond that, we anticipate that labs such as the one um, that Bellevue is a part of and other commercial labs will come online hopefully as soon as next week. But I think the important thing is, um, and the mayor has been very vocal on this, we need the CDC to send more test kits because we anticipate that we're going we're gonna to burn through these and we need all the test kits we can get. So we have the capacity to do 1,000 tests, 1, not per day. No, in we total, in total. Okay, so There's we could burn through 1,000 tests very quickly. And in, in order to expand beyond that, we need uh, essentially uh, reagents from the CDC. What is it that we're, we're waiting from them? Yeah, the CDC and FDA to approve tests that have been developed by private health care, private health institutions, so that they can come online quickly and help provide that, that surge that's needed of test capacity. And why are the feds delaying? What, what's the challenge there? You know, I think there's um, probably a number of reasons, but um, I think we are in an emergency situation where we need to cut through bureaucracy to help get tests to market uh, in a way that's safe, accurate, reliable, but really meets the demands that we're seeing in community. Seems pretty urgent that we expand that capacity. What can we do to help expedite that? Can the city council do anything to help expedite the provision of additional I think certainly kits? calling on the CDC, adding your voices and calling on the CDC and FDA would be very helpful. We will absolutely do that. Thank you. What is the cost to a New Yorker of getting a test? Right now there's no cost to a New Yorker other than what they might get uh, through their health care system, but th we don't want cost to be a barrier, so we are not charging for the COVID-19 uh, test. I think it goes without saying that even uninsured New Yorkers and undocumented New Yorkers always have the option of our public hospital system. Absolutely. We've talked a lot about the potential for measures such as uh, advising people to avoid uh, large public gatherings. We want to be clear that that is not being recommended currently. Uh, this, call, this falls under the category of social distancing measures. Help us understand what would trigger your decision to alter the advice to New Yorkers related to social distancing. You know, I, let me just first um, talk a little bit about what it is um, before talking about what the options might be. So, Social distancing is kind of what it sounds like. It means simply putting distance between people to make it less likely they, that they can transmit the virus from person to person. And so there, it's a spectrum of potential options that can be easy or all the way through very challenging. And so the easiest sort of uh, example of social distancing is when we tell people who are sick, let's say with the flu, stay home, don't come to work, don't send your kid to work, that's a form of social distancing. When we advise um, businesses to implement their um, telecommuting, that could also be seen as another form of social distancing. So there are many things that could potentially be deployed um, before we even get to considering canceling large gatherings. I think many, or if, I would say, let me rephrase that, our efforts are geared towards really aggressively trying to contain this, understanding that there may come a point where we will see more person-to-person -person spread in the community. But the reason why we're being aggressive now is so that we won't need to implement such potentially um, aggressive measures. We will if we have to, but we would rather not get to that point. And that point will arrive when you've determined that the number of cases, the severity of cases, our latest understanding on how it's transmission, how it's transmitted, uh, have passed the threshold. And I understand that's not formulaic. I was there just going to say, there's no playbook for that. Um, but the, the measures that we will take in place include the number of people, the spread, as well as the severity. 
There are New Yorkers who are not yet sick, but have been mandated to quarantine, maybe because of their travel history, maybe because they've had known contact with someone who has tested positive. There are also some New Yorkers who, for whom it's been recommended that they self-isolate or quarantine, and, and many of them are doing that as well. Do you know the number of people who have been mandated or recommended to be quarantined in New York City? So recently, the CDC increased its guidance of returning travelers who should uh, do home isolation for 14 days. Um, and those countries include China, Italy, Iran, South Korea. And then we, along with the state, have increased that to include Japan. And so the challenge is that um, we haven't, as of yet, received uh, uh, manifests from uh, CDC as to exactly the number of people that are coming in from those countries since that just happened. Um, it's not an insignificant number, and so what we do is we... Would it be in the hundreds? It would be more than the hundreds. I think right now we're looking at roughly somewhere around 2,000 people. Not necessarily all New Yorkers. Some could be travelers who have been waylaid here. Exactly. How does someone who's on home isolation get food or prescription medicine? So someone who is on home isolation, these are returning passengers who were in the affected countries and are asymptomatic. And so home isolation doesn't mean that they can't go out at all. It means that we want them to limit their outdoor activity. And when they arrive, they receive the health department's number, they receive the types of symptoms that we want them to look out for. And then we advise them to call us, to call their health provider to determine testing options for them. And so um, it's okay for them to go out, but to limit their movement. Good. The flip side of the good news that young children appear to be less vulnerable is that older adults, senior citizens, appear to be the most vulnerable, uh, especially those with medical com com complications. Um, could you speak to any preparations that we've made to focus on older New Yorkers and others who are vulnerable, maybe those with disabilities? Um, I know we have representatives of DIFTA here, if, if appropriate, to call on them, but perhaps either, either or both of you or any of you could speak to how we're addressing what are clearly the most vulnerable in the city? So let me start by saying that, yes, the vast majority of people who do develop COVID-19 are adults, but I don't want to give the impression that kids don't get it at all. Um, children can be infected by COVID-19, but what we see from other countries, they are very mildly affected. Um, you know, there may be situations where a child may have a chronic underlying illness, they may be immunocompromised, and so they may, may be at greater risk. But by and large, the vast majority of children um, may not get affected, and if they are affected, they are mildly affected. What we're seeing across the world is that currently, the individuals who are more severely affected and have um, unfortunately succumbed to the illness tend to be elderly individuals with chronic underlying illnesses. And so we have been working very closely with our partners at um, the Department for the Aging to make sure that we are providing appropriate guidance on uh, a number of different areas in terms of, for example, um, how to handle large gatherings, how to provide information, most importantly in many languages about what is COVID-19, how can I protect myself, which are the very sort of basic preventative measures that we've been giving. Finally, the um, city has a large workforce, 300,000 plus many of whom work directly in healthcare or in first, as first responders. Could you speak to measures that we are putting in place to protect our workforce, especially those in the critical areas I mentioned, um, and also to deal with what will be probably quite an increased burden of workload on those who are in critical uh, job categories that are going to see increased uh, work obligations uh, considering this mounting crisis? 
So today we put into effect a commissioner's order that requires um, frontline city workers who are returning from affected areas and um, have symptoms or don't have symptoms to either get tested or be on mandatory home quarantine for four, 14 days. And the reason for that is we need to maximize our workforce. And if they are coming back from areas where they could have potentially been affected, we don't want then that infection to potentially, there's always the small risk being spread to others. Beyond that, as first responders, we wanna make sure that um, if they are symptomatic but have not accessed care or have not been tested, that they don't then spread that to other individuals. And so that's a very critical part of what we're doing with regards to our preparedness and ensuring the, the safety of New Yorkers. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to the administration. And now I'm going to pass it off to Chair Rivera. Thank you so much. So you mentioned some of the individuals who were most at risk, but what are we doing to protect those high-risk groups, and, and what is the messaging that you have for them? So the, the most basic message, and I realize that sometimes it can sound a little bit um, not dramatic, a little bit like, really, that's all you got for me, um, is the frequent hand washing, the covering of the mouth and the nose when coughing or sneezing, um, doing it into your sleeve as opposed to into your hands, and if you're feeling symptomatic, to communicate with your doctor. That holds for everybody. With regards to the most vulnerable, you know, we want to make sure that, for example, we've got good communications with our um, nursing homes in the city that we've got good communications with our senior centers to ensure that if that they are clear on what the prevention guidelines are if they are in need of any particular equipment that we get it to them so for example we have distributed uh, I would say roughly a million face masks to nursing homes, not because face masks are gonna prevent someone from getting COVID-19, but more because nursing homes tend to be places where people spread the flu, and putting a mask on someone who is symptomatic helps to avoid other people getting sick. And so those are the very sort of concrete things that we've done to help prepare our sister agencies with regards to um, preventative messages for their clients as well as best practices for themselves. And just to confirm, can someone spread COVID-19 during the incubation period? There's no indication that asymptomatic people are um, responsible for the explosion of um, COVID-19. You know, there have been uh, many studies that have been coming out around how this virus is behaving, but there's no indication that during the asymptomatic period, people are infectious. And are you conducting outreach in languages other than English? So we have, um, within our activated infrastructure, a group that is specifically geared towards um, developing all of our materials in several languages. We've done a lot of outreach um, initially with the Asian American community, but that has increased all over the city with all of our community-based partners to share that information in several languages. What about those with visual or hearing impairments or those who require American Sign Language? And then I want to ask also about people with disabilities and or chronic conditions. How are we sticking with the messaging of, of being prepared and taking care of yourself, but also tailoring it to understand that they are at risk or they might have to approach this a little bit differently? So with regards to the language access, um, we have available for our um, community meetings, translation, excuse me, interpretation services. We also um, make available uh, 
First, we try to use staff that are bilingual in whatever the language we think is going to be most needed at that particular meeting. And then if we can't, we provide um, interpreter services. Um, with regards to um, sign language or that for the visually impaired, I, I have to say that our um, website is ADA compliant, but I think that we're probably, we could do better on the sign language. Um, and then the last question you had was related to those that have um, disabilities. And or chronic conditions. And or chronic conditions. So that's a part of our um, standard messaging to ensure that those who may have chronic underlying conditions are, um, are emphasized that they above all should really be reaching out to their providers when they become symptomatic, especially if there's been a travel nexus. And even without a travel nexus, now that we're moving to what seems to be person-to-person -person transmission and community, they should have a lower threshold for reaching out to their providers. And so the mayor mentioned- and I'm sorry, one more thing. Yeah. To also remind those individuals that if they've got prescriptions that need to be refilled, this is the time to do it. Don't delay in uh, refilling prescriptions. So the mayor mentioned in a press conference last week that the city had 1,200 hospital beds if necessary to cope with a potential influx of COVID-19 cases. How many of those are at health and hospitals? Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair. Uh, well, I think it makes, it makes sense to focus most on the negative pressure rooms. So we, because that's where we would want to be managing people who had COVID. Uh, 19, of which we have 376 uh, negative pressure rooms at our uh, acute 11 hospitals. That being said, typically a negative pressure room would only house one person because obviously the whole purpose is to prevent transmission of disease. In a very difficult scenario where a hospital had hundreds of people who had severe COVID-19, you first step would likely be putting more than one person with the same COVID-19 illness in the same negative pressure room. Uh, beyond that, we are prepared in every single hospital to utilize non-patient spaces if we need additional room for patients. And so you're prepared to do this at most of your facilities? Does that include um areas like Rikers Island? So uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the correctional health situation um, because uh, it's known that respiratory viruses can travel quickly in any kind of close quarters, which would, which would describe many correctional facilities. Uh, they have done a good job of increasing the amount of sanitizing that they're doing, working on making sure that there's a smooth system for immediately identifying anyone with symptoms. So anyone with respiratory symptoms at Rikers Island will immediately be removed and sent to Bellevue or Elmhurst if a woman um, to be evaluated and kept there. We wouldn't return a symptomatic person uh, to a correctional facility. And I wanted to ask, because people are getting a lot of conflicting in ad advice, whether people should just show up to their doctor, should they call ahead, and how are medical facilities and hospitals making sure that they're keeping anyone who might have coronavirus, potentially, I guess, separated from someone who will have the flu? I'll start. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, I think that it's always good if people call ahead. I mean, it's always, that's always a good practice. Uh, but we, we've made sure at all our health and hospital facilities that right at registration, we can separate people who have respiratory illnesses. Um, and as Dr. Barbeau said, most of them are not gonna be COVID. Most of them are going to be influenza or other kinds of infectious respiratory viruses. Uh, we have actually sent out what we call secret shoppers, uh, people who pose as patients uh, to see how quick does the mask come out you know, does the person go to a separate room? Uh, and when, when that's not noted, we immediately re-educate people, know if somebody comes uh, with a respiratory symptom, he, here is what to do, and we, we practice that so, so that we are uh, very good at that. Um, 
Obviously, because as Dr. Barbeau has very articulately said, there are issues around testing. Uh, in the beginning, we would, we would separate people. We'd make sure that we did not put somebody who was suspected of COVID-19 uh, with another patient. And while uh, Health and Hospitals has not yet had a patient who turned out to be positive, we've practiced extensively because we've taken care of many people so far who are presumed cases. So as far as anybody knew, they were COVID-19 patients and they were all uh, segregated. The majority of them were taken care of at Bellevue, but not exclusively at Bellevue. So just a couple more questions because I know we have many people on deck. So the governor recently announced funding, emergency funding, to assist the city. And I, I'd like to know what's the estimated economic impact and do you feel, and I think some of my colleagues have asked this before, how the city can better prepare economically in terms of what you need for resources? You know, I think the mayor has been very clear that um, money has not been sort of at the forefront of our response, that we have gone, uh, taken a very aggressive stance and putting as many protective measures in place as available to us. That being said, certainly there is a role for the federal government to reimburse us. Um, you know, I think that the reality is that we have been so focused on getting the work done that I think the tally of the numbers is, is yet to come. And in preparing to, well, really just protect our workers, right, who are on the front lines, who are dealing with patients, we have our airport workers, our school nurses in our, in our Department of Education system, what are we doing to make sure that they're informed, that they understand what to do, and that we're protecting them? Many of our hospital workers will be working overtime, right? They're not really allowed to go home. They have to come in for a shift. Correct. So how are we finding that balance and making sure that everyone is protected? Well, I'll start with the school nurses, and then, Mitch, if you want to talk to the healthcare workers. We have sent out guidance to all of the school nurses so that they are reminded of universal precautions, what to do in the event that a child with symptoms and potential travel is appropriately uh, set aside from the rest of the school community until they can be uh, transported to medical care or have their care caretaker bring, it, bring them uh, home. Um, Mitch, I don't know if you want to add for the hospitals. Well, certainly. Uh Hospital and healthcare workers are one of the groups most at risk because they're taking care of people who are actively sick, who likely have higher uh, viral shedding. Um, uh, the good part is they're also the group that knows the best how to protect themselves, and we do have uh, protective equipment. We, we teach hard on uh, what is the right protective equipment for the right situation. We try to always remember it's not just the doctor and nurse. It's the environmental service person. It's the dietary person who's bringing in the trays to the person. It's the technician who's doing the EKG on the patient. Um, so that we're sure that everybody is wearing the correct equipment um, and protecting themselves. And then, as you said, uh, uh, Chair Rivera, there is a strong tradition in, among physicians, among nurses and pharmacists and other healthcare professionals, this is our duty to care for the sick. And that sometimes means staying late, it sometimes means putting yourself at risk, um, because no, no piece of equipment is foolproof, as happened in the Ebola epidemic. Um, so uh, we work very hard with our staff to make sure that, that they're getting the equipment they need. <clears throat> the only, the only um, piece of information that I would add to what uh, the doctors have mentioned about school nurses, on any given day, there's 98% uh, of our schools have nurse coverage. Uh, and there are a small number of schools, well, not, not insignificant because we're such a large system, that depend on contract nurses. Uh, as Dr. Barbeau has said, this mayor has said that uh, finances will not be an issue, so by next week, every school will have a nurse on their campus, uh, and that's part of our safety protocol as well. Thank you so much, and with that, I, I want to turn it over to the next uh, council member. That'll be Council Member Traeger. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry to, oh. to jump in. And, and happy to hear from you. Just want to clarify that we, we lose the administration in about 15 minutes. 
because they have to go deal with this crisis. So we're going to have to do something unusual and have uh, our colleagues on the clock. We apologize. It's just uh, a very pressing situation. So please, Councilmember Traeger. Sure. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll spell out my questions and then the, the panel can answer. I guess just initially to, to uh, DOE, to the Chancellor, uh, again, thank you for your office being very responsive to mine. I do appreciate that. You just mentioned about uh, nurses, an issue that we have raised and we've talked about. Does that uh, commitment apply to all public and non-public schools? Secondly, with regards to guidance, uh, uh, to schools. I, I appreciate your office has sent a lot of guidance. If you could just walk us through, if a child in a classroom reports to his or her teacher that they don't feel well, what is the school supposed to do? That is, I think, an, just it's important, it's important to get crystal clear clarity on that. Um, also, we've heard a lot of, uh, uh, you know, talk about students, but also our school staff. Um, and if they don't feel well, what is guidance to them and how are we making sure that we are being mindful of, of their safety? And does all this guidance and support apply to UPK 3K sites that are on non-DOE property? How are we making sure that they are adequately stocked and supplied with resources and guidance which they need? To our health commissioner and H&H, uh, &H, a lot of the guidance you see on the websites for CDC and other health organizations say, contact your health care provider. Um, how are we making sure that the primary care doctor in the community is being informed about what to do if someone reports them that, that they're sick, particularly in communities that speak other languages other than English? Um, are they getting all the information which they need? Are they going to get the capacity to conduct testing, or is it only being conducted in the hospital system? Primary care doctors in the communities need to know what the process looks like as well. So I'll start, uh, those are my questions, and I'll let the panel uh, answer them. Thank you. So we're going to take this as a lightning round. So we'll, we'll go very quickly. So it, as, as it pertains to the nurses, we will get back to you on non-pubs. But I will tell you, generally speaking, our approach at this time is that we are serving the children of New York. So we have not drawn any distinction between our DOE schools, our non-public schools, the charter schools, or our early education centers that are community-based. We are sharing guidance with everybody, and that includes uh, the, the cleaning supplies. We, we are taking cleaning supplies to everyone as well. Um, and I know that was one of the questions, so the answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, our school staff, so it, the, the, the guidance that we've provided is such. If a teacher notices that a student is sick, uh, the teacher will tell the nurse or the principal uh, that this student is presenting sick. The nurse or the designee, then if the student is sick and complaining of a fever, a cough, or a shortness of breath, school staff uh, should ask the student to put on a mask uh, and we have now provided masks to all of our schools. Uh, call a parent for pickup and advise the parent to call a medical provider for instructions on the next step. Uh, the student will wait with an adult in a room uh, with a door away from other students, so we segregate the student until the parent is able to come and pick up the student. Uh, the adult that waits with the student will also be provided a mask and stay at least three feet away from the child in the room. So we have some distancing, but they're still in the same room together. Uh, and then the nurse, uh, and this is critically important, the nurse will inform the health director. And that's critically important because those health directors then are reporting to the Department of Health so that we have accurate information. The principal then will contact their superintendent and the borough uh, office, and then we all will get additional guidance from the Department of Health from there. So it's a very clear protocol of what happens. The same thing, except we're not waiting for an adult, uh, 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 a parent, pertains to staff members. So if a staff member comes to school, presents uh, ill, that person will check with the nurse, but then that person will be sent home. Uh, with the same instructions, contact your health provider and then um, get get seen. Um, and I think those are the DOE questions. So for us, we do regular uh, email blasts to a network of providers that includes um, tens of thousands of doctors in the city. And specific, so we've mobilized that. And then specifically, we've also done in collaboration with the state health department webinars where 
Um, doctors can call in, ask questions, learn, excuse me, um, learn the most up-to-date information uh, and be able to ask questions of uh, experts. And so the last, sorry, can somebody, I need somebody to get this for me. Thank you. Uh, the last webinar that we did, over 3,000 providers participated in the webinar. And so we have been providing uh, patient education materials for them. In different languages? Patient education in different languages for them to post in their offices, yes. A, a key additional resource for New Yorkers is 311. Uh, and 311 will triage the call if the person uh, has no symptoms and is looking for testing, the, the, per, the call will be routed to the Department of Health. If the person has any symptoms, they'll be routed to health and hospitals. And we have live doctors and nurses who will take the call in real time. And because it's 311, there's excellent language capability um, to speak all of the languages of New York City. Thank you. So we, we have to finish up here. Uh, there are four council members who each get, we have only about two minutes on the clock uh, because the administration has to leave. So we're going to go Councilmember Levin and then Councilmember Eugene, then Councilmember Holden, then Councilmember Barron. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Um, so I just, uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, the definition of close contact and casual contact. Um, the EU's health agencies, the European Union Health Agency, this is from uh, Kaiser Health News, offers a descriptive definition, someone living in the same house, this is close contact definition, someone living in the same household as a, as a patient, someone who has had face-to-face -face contact with or been in an enclosed environment with a patient, or a healthcare worker directly caring for a patient. It's also any plane, or by extension, train or bus, passenger sitting within two seats, in any direction of an infected person. WHO flags healthcare providers and household members as well as anyone that, who's been within three feet of a confirmed case once the infected person had symptoms. So when we're talking about uh, proximity here, I ride the subway, being within two seats of somebody is, is not, it's, you know, there, that's, a, that's a lot of people. And, um, and, and the CDC's definition is close contact. That's, so I just want to be clear. We're not talking about other end of the train. I'm talking about the person sitting next to me. If I sneeze and I'm infected, are Alika and Keith, you know, in close contact? Right. So uh, I know Dr. Barbo had to, to take an emergency call, so, mm -hmm. but I've heard her, her answer, and I'll combine it with my clinical knowledge. Uh, what she said, which is absolutely true, is that what so far has been driving the pandemic has been close contact as in sharing the same household. It has not been two seats away. Uh, that being said, there, there is common sense, which you're alluding to. Um, if, if somebody was two seats away from me on the subway, would I be concerned about them spreading uh, a COVID-19 to me, no. If they sneezed on me, yeah. yes. And I think that's because, this has been explained, it's a respiratory droplet. And yes. so if someone, and I think that's, I think what that two seats sort of gets in common sense is how far a droplet is going to go. Yes. And the distinction, again, that Dr. Barbeau made is it is different than diseases like measles where it hangs in the air. Yes. You don't need the, the sneeze directly on you. Right. But, okay, just lastly, you know, the, the curve of infection outside of China over the last month is an exponential curve. If you look at it, it, it actually is the shape of an exponential curve. That's, that's a fact, I just, according to Johns Hopkins. Uh, uh, so we are, are we likely to see in New York City an exponential curve? Obviously it's a novel virus, so nobody knows, but in general, our expectation is that cases will increase, um, right? That we are seeing the beginning, right? Uh, now as is true of uh, exponential curves, as you saw, China is now reporting decreasing, yes. right? And what, why is that? That's because people are gaining immunity 
Um, they're, they're being infected. They're either having no symptoms and developing immunity or they're getting sick and developing immunity. Um, and then once you have immunity, then you're not going to get it again. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, next up is Council Member Eugene. Thank you all very much. Uh, uh, Doc, let me let me let me say that I, I, I truly believe that uh, in New York City we have everything that it takes to address the issue. We got the, the best uh, health uh, system. We got the great expert, wonderful expert in medicine. But it seems that there's something is missing: resources. Because according to uh, your testimony or the testimony of of the uh, commissioner, you can only test through 1,000 people, 1,000 cases. And we do know that uh, in, in time of epidemic or pandemic, it is very important that we test people. This is the only way we're going to have a better knowledge, an accurate knowledge of the cases and how many people are affected and what to do. My question, my first question, I'm going to go quick. Is it fair enough to say that we are still learning about COVID-19? And my second question is that, we know that one of the faculty of viruses is the ability to go through a mutation using the cell of the host, the cell of the patient, to change the, the, the genetic information. Is, are you in contact, are we in contact, we in New York City, with all the health authorities outside the United States to learn about the trend of viruses that affect certain people and to see if there is any modification in the United States in order for us to work properly and to find the way to have a good vaccine. Uh, well, thank you, Council Member. Uh, so on, on the first issue, um, uh, well, let, let me do the, the, the more complicated and we'll go, then go back to the easier one. On the resistance, there's so far, you're absolutely right, viruses mutate. Uh, sometimes they mutate to become less uh, serious and sometimes more serious. There's no evidence so far that this particular virus is mutating. Usually when viruses mutate, it's in response to treatment. They evolve usually to escape the treatment. And right now there isn't any treatment, so there's no, there's no real evolutionary pressure on the virus. So at least, at least to date that hasn't been an issue, but you're absolutely right to point out, and I think some of what scares people is when you have a new virus, you don't know its future, right? If you take a virus like measles, it's been around and we've understood it, you, you have a sense of what it does. I think that's part of what fuels it. I think on the testing, you, you have a very key issue, and we, as we've spoken, we hope that you'll join with us in advocating to the FDA and the CDC the need to speed up the approvals. There's the normal regulatory path, and then there's we're in the middle of a pandemic path, and that's supposed to be a different path. Um, and this particular, the testing that we're talking about, DNA testing is not unique. We do this for a large variety of viruses. This is not brand new. Um, they need to license it, and we very much appreciate the City Council's support on that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Thank you, Councilmember Eugene. Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'll, be, I'll try to be quick. <laughs> um, how long can the uh, virus, the uh, COVID-19 virus, last on a surface? You know, we, Live. We, it's a great question, and I, I understand why people are concerned about it. It's very hard to study. In a laboratory setting, people can show for many viruses way, way longer that the, that the virus is there, and yet it doesn't really act that way, which likely means that there's a difference between viability, as in I came and cultured something off of a surface, and its ability to infect people. Uh, just the fact that, that the transmission is person to person says that, it, that the virus can't be very hardy on surfaces. Because if it was, it would all have a completely different epidemiology. All of the epidemiology is saying this is respiratory secretions going from person to person. Certainly, if, you know, right away the sneeze lands on the, the desk, 
right, and you're seconds away, that virus is likely to be viable. Um, but then again, it's not in the person, right? So you, you, it's not just a question of is the virus viable, but how is it getting into the body and is that but, happening but we, fast we, enough? But we really don't know. So if somebody sneezes into their hand, let's say, and then holds uh, the, uh, uh, the pole in the, um, you know, uh, in the subway and somebody else touches it and then touches their face, this is how it gets out. And so that's why we're scrubbing surfaces. A absolutely. I, again, I'll just say it, the, the epidemiologist is acting like, but that's not the most common. The most common seems to be two people that are so close that they're actually sharing respiratory secretions. Right. But, so, but, but, it's but still other, like, it still could happen. Absolutely. All right. So, so what should, like, the, let's say we're in the subway. What should I do? Should I wear gloves? Should I... Where I shouldn't wear a mask because we heard, we were told that masks are not, don't work. We we don't recommend masks. Uh, frequent hand washing and avoiding touching using your touching your hand to your mouth or nose or eyes, right? Because it's it's not about being on your skin. It's about entering your it's, body through a mucous membrane. Okay, just one question, speaker, about the procedure when somebody walks into a hospital. Do you give them a mask? Let's say I, I have flu symptoms. Do you? Yes. In the waiting room, I get a mask. Correct. Okay. That's, that's good. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three very brief questions. What measures are in place to ensure that those persons who are supposed to self-quarantine are, in fact, doing that? Uh, the Department of, of Health does both schedule checks and they do random checks uh, to people's houses to make sure that they are actually isolating themselves. Thank you. And to Mr. Chancellor, is there one standard protocol for all of the schools as to what measures the custodial staff will put in place? Is it, should I see the same thing at every school? And what are the funds that are going to be required to make that happen? Is that going to be a strain on the individual school? So yes, the, the, the protocols are standard, uh, and that's the guidance that we've sent to schools. We also have our custodial supervisors that are doing walkthroughs. I like the uh, anonymous shopper uh, analogy. We're, we're dropping in and making sure. Uh, the supplies, we're ensuring that every school has a 30-day supply of cleaning supplies. And that's especially important because we've ramped up the, the deep cleaning. So that'll be twice a week. Uh, we've done a survey and we know who needs to have additional supplies, but that will not come out of schools' budgets. Thank you. And to emergency management, uh, this society, this country, has oftentimes not dealt equitably with communities of color. Who is making sure that the trains that are being cleaned uh, are in fact being done equitably throughout a particular line, or all lines, I should say, so that it's not any one line that's being serviced more than any other line. Who's making sure that that happens? Because we know that Department of Transportation gives certain communities older buses, and there are other documented instances of inequities. So who's making sure that my community is getting their subways clean at the same rate as any other community? Yeah, I know the, the obviously the MTA is uh, state-run, um, and uh, I know they're in process of cleaning uh, as much as they can. But the, to your question, uh, you know, they, they, we're coordinating with them and if there's anything that you're noticing that's not happening, we'll take that back to Can we get a record of how often it's done by each line? I'd like to see that. We will, we will make that request to them, yes, ma'am. The, Thank the, you. Thank just you. so you know, Councilman, the announcement was made, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's actually happened yet, but the announcement was made a couple of days ago that uh, the MTA said they're going to clean, clean every subway car and station every 72 hours. They said every subway car and station. So if you don't see that happening, we should let the MTA I'd know. like to get a report because I can't be at all of them and I just want someone to document that that's what's happening. And the final question Thank is going to go to Keith Powers and then we're done with the administration. Thank you, Dr. Barbo, for coming back. This is the final question. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the testimony. Um, for the chancellor, I want to first say thank you to your team for getting back to me with quick information relating to absences and admissions. But I just wanted to just clarify, can you just give us on the record what the policy is related to absences uh, for this school year now? The mayor made an uh, announcement yesterday. Can you just clarify exactly what the new announcement is? 
Yes, Council Member. So um, the absences have to do with the application process as part of the screens in some of the schools. Some of the schools, as part of their application, give a weight to absences. So for the students that are in transition grades this year, transitioning into middle schools that have screens or high schools that have screens, their absence report is last year's absence. Mm -hmm. So they're okay. The question is if, if God forbid, we have uh, an increase and there's a lot of student absences, it's those students that next year will be applying to middle schools and high schools. The concern was will the absences count against us next year? So what we have said is we have frozen all absences from the screening processes and the application processes. Students will be held harmless as it pertains to absences as it pertains to application to school. So fourth and seventh graders. Correct. Absences will not be counted against some coronavirus or not. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. And that was applies to the school year? That's correct. So for going back to pre-coronavirus. So what, whatever, whatever the... The total measurement. The total yeah. measurement is that's being frozen. And latenesses. We'll your pardon? Latenesses. Some schools count latenesses. That will still continue to be... A factor? We'll get back to you specifically on that. Okay. And um, my uh, final question are, is the DOE have the cap capacity to, some, some schools are looking to combining latenesses and absences. It does like the computer systems that you use for tracking attendance and absences allow you to be able to do this? Because I think some parents have wondered whether it was really actually plausible based on technology and computer systems used. Yeah, we, we have the capability of doing it, um, you know, so absolutely. And, and schools will know not to use it? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Powers, uh, and I want to thank you all for being here. I know you're dealing with a lot, so I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, thank you all, and we look forward to continued conversations together. Uh, if folks uh, could then uh, that are leaving leave the chambers because we have additional panels uh, that we are calling up and I believe I'll call them up so we want to call up uh, is um, the president of the UFT uh, here Michael Mulgrew if you could please uh, have great So we'll have him. copies of the testimony? Great. Uh, President Mulgrew, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having us and for having this hearing. You, you may begin and take as much time as you need. I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be brief because there's been a lot going on over the last couple of weeks and I want to thank the uh, you, you uh, for your leadership on this, and I want to thank the chair. Um, there's a lot of concern, clearly, in throughout our communities, but specifically, as we all know, that the school is the center of every community, and every day uh, we are lucky enough that we get hundreds and sometimes thousands of visitors who are known as our students, and this is something, as we move into what we know will be a challenge for this city, uh, that we have to make sure that we have clear guidance to all school communities. And I'm here today to say that we are very happy that over the last week and a half, we have worked very closely with the mayor's office, with city council, and with Chancellor Carranza to make sure that there's clear guidance now that is going out to each and every school. Guidance for the nurses and for people in case there are issues of people showing symptoms, guidance for general guidance for all schools in terms of what we should be looking for, as well as things that may happen into the future. Things that we are doing ourselves right now is we are looking at all of the different 
school communities, uh, we know that in February, we, there was a break and many people traveled. And we are, that thankfully, we are so happy that, that our members and our teachers have reached out to us. They have told us what is going on. They have reached out to the Department of Health in terms of what their concerns were and if, if then followed the proper procedures. Now, moving forward, we have to make sure that we'll be survey surveying all of our chapter leaders tomorrow afternoon. So we know that each school and the new protocols say that there will now be deep cleanings multiple times a week in each and every school building in New York City. That is great that that decision has been made. Now we have to make sure that those things are happening. In order for those things to happen, we have to make sure that the supplies are in place and the new disinfectant is there. So we will be doing a survey of all of our schools tomorrow afternoon to make sure that that is in place, as well as as we have said, at times we have had challenges for school uh, bathrooms to make sure that they have soap and paper towels, which becomes a major piece right now. It's not something that should ever be a challenge, but it is a challenge, and now we have to make sure that all of those things are in place. And in terms of newer type of supplies that are not uh, normal to a school, we need to, uh, the city has put out the proper guidance that each school now needs to have full length gowns, medical gowns, face masks, gloves, which they've always had, and face shields. So these are the things that are gonna be needed in case there is uh, the need for isolation. So all of those things right now, we will be sur surveying all of the schools tomorrow afternoon, and we are, in anything that we get back, we will be reporting. We do have some concern because there are a number of schools who do not have nurses, and I know that that is something that just came up with your previous questions. It shouldn't take a crisis to get that problem solved. Just, it needs to be solved. Um, we've heard different things over the years. I'll just put it in very simple terms for everyone. There are 70,000 children in New York City each and every day without a healthcare professional in their building. Just make it simple. So we are, and it, it, giving guidance to a school that somebody needs to act as one is not, uh, something we feel is appropriate, we really need to get and make sure that we have a nurse inside of each and every school and every child should have access to one. So as we move forward, we know that information, transparency, testing, and education is the way to deal with this challenge that we now currently have in front of us. So we look forward to doing this work with you here in City Council, as you have always done on behalf of the school communities. and really just being, tr this transparency in a crisis is always the biggest thing that challenges us and frustrates me personally. Information, we are looking to safeguard people. We want no demonization of anyone. We want every school community to have what they're supposed to have, the protocols in place, the supplies in place, and the support from the Department of Education in the communication to each and every one of the parents whenever an issue does pop up inside of a school. We are not here being Pollyannish. I'm very proud of the members of the UHT, UFT. They said, tell us what we should be doing, what are the proper protocols, and, you just, and you, if we have what we're supposed to have, we will make sure those things are followed. So this is how we are approaching this entire challenging scenario. But I do have great faith in New York City, and I know I have great faith in our teachers and our UFT members and our school communities because they have faced many things before. And they now look forward to questions from this city council, and I will say this again, we will get through this by doing this work together with you. So thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you, President Mogaro. Just uh, one uh, quick question for me, and then I'm happy to turn it over first to our education chair, who may have some questions. But you say in your testimony, you didn't read your testimony, but in your testimony it says... You had enough today. I didn't yeah, think you needed that. It says, you said school closure should be a tool of, quote, last resort. Yes. And should be considered on a school building by school building case. Again, it's important to have a full understanding of the facts before any significant action is taken. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, also, I, I'm, in my role as a, a, a national vice president for the teachers union, we were, we're dealing with this across the, uh, across the United States. So when you have someone who, one, has either traveled through 
re recently to one of the zones, or we have confirmed con uh, ca contact with a person who has been confirmed to have coronavirus, then we have to see if any of the symptoms occur. If the symptoms occur, then we must quickly isolate, bring that, use the isolation protocol at the school level, and that could be for a student or a staff member. And then we would follow the medical procedures of testing and then waiting to see what happens. So if you have multiple tests going on but nothing is being confirmed, there is no reason to close a school. And remember, this is New York City. If we close a school, students are st will then have no place to go and might be out, out and about. Uh, all over our city. And there's a cascading effect because Correct. there's a significant number of students where one of the meals they get of the day is at school. Yes. Where certain parents can't afford uh, child care. Uh, so there, there are these other factors that we don't always think about, but that we have to think about before taking a step like that. Absolutely. That is absolutely right. So we have to look at all of those factors. But we are also not, and you can see from my testimony, we were very clear saying that there is no reason never to close a school. Yes. Because there will, there can be at times, medically there might be reasons that for health concerns that we would close a school. Yes. Uh, just one final question. How are, how are the members feeling? How are the teachers, given the environment that we're in, are they feeling like the Department of Education is being uh, responsive to their concerns? The chancellor is here and talked about the communication protocols that are in place. Councilor Powers just asked about the absence issue related mm -hmm. to uh, students getting into certain schools and how attendance is weighted in the application process. You and your testimony outlined the custodial engineers and the cleaning that they're doing. Can you just speak uh, for uh, sort of more generally about every New Yorker's a little anxious right now, yeah. are concerned, but it hasn't seemed like anyone's panicking. Everyone is actually going about their daily lives, taking the precautions that they need, listening to the public health officials, listening to the governor and the mayor on a daily basis with the new facts and the new cases. From a, from a workforce perspective, uh, how are your members feeling right now generally from what you're hearing? You said you're you're meeting with the chapter leaders uh, that's coming up. What are you hearing so far? So we went out of our way to start communicating early with our members about the facts. We've been using the CDC protocols and FAQs, so we have been sending those out. Last Sunday we did a system-wide mail uh, contact with all the members of the UFT. And the more information we give people, the, the not calm, but okay, we understand is the thing. So the key here is for the whole city to understand that just give everyone the facts. Don't sugarcoat it. Just tell them what the facts. Have faith that people will read, they'll understand it. They call us if they have a question, we give them the answers. If people, you know, if there's an isolation needs to be done, not this is what you need to do. If someone needs a quarantine, fine, we'll take care of that. The whole idea is that everyone knows that if a situation arises, that there is a proper process in place, and that process is there to safeguard you as well as uh, the students. The beautiful part in this very tough situation is the teachers who have contacted us with concerns, their first concern at all times is, my biggest thing is, you tell me what to do, I wanna make sure that my students are safe. And they have said that over and over, and that is the spirit that I have seen throughout for the last couple of weeks. Uh, to, for the UFT members. So I'm very thankful that you just asked that question, but I would say that we're, we are prepared and ready to go. And, you know, the situation could change as we've seen Absolutely. New, new infections that have come in and the Department of Health are working with uh, state officials. The governor's been having briefings every day. The mayor's been having briefings every day. The state health commissioner, the city health commissioner in this evolving process. Uh, decisions may have to change at some point right now in the yeah. day that we're in today. That hasn't been the case. And one of the things, uh, I'm not sure if you were here when the chancellor said this, uh, but that at this moment in time, out of 1.1 million school children in New York City, we haven't seen any child present symptoms at all on this line. So that's a good thing. Again, if that changes, we'll have to adapt and yep. figure out what that means. But I think that's a, a good thing, at least up to this moment. I want to hand it off to the chair of our education committee, uh, Chair Traeger. Thank you to the speaker and thank you, President Mogru. I, I I still consider myself a proud UFT member, and I'm in touch with UFT colleagues every single day. UFT has been spot on 
proactively giving out information. I, I hear it from the school community, so I want to thank you for leadership and, and, and to your you. team as well. Um, we heard the chancellor before address some questions raised by my colleagues, myself, with regards to nurses. Now, yep. uh, I am, we heard testimony, which we still need some clarity on, with regards to the DOE will be uh, providing additional nurses. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if they are going to provide contract nurses and not, I'm not sure if these are gonna be UFT nurses, but if these are gonna be contract nurses, do contract nurses have access to children's DOE health records? I, but that is something you would have to ask the Department of Education. You're talking basically about uh, contracting for a day-to-day, -day basically uh, uh, a day-to-day, -day, we would consider to be like a substitute but acting as a nurse. Right. You would have to ask the Department of Education that because they're not our members. Right, and, and that is very important because DOE nurses are critically important to our schools. Do we have data with you, Mr. President, how many DOE nurses we have in our schools? We have 116 buildings that have no nurse or school-based health clinics. Uh, it's basically 137 schools because some of those buildings yeah. have multiple schools, and it's 70,000 school children. So over 70,000 kids do not have a healthcare professional, which leads me to the next issue. Uh, is, is there a freeze, by the way, in hiring UFT nurses that we, that we know of? The city tells us there's a complicated ratio process back and forth, but let's be clear, this could get solved quite simply. There just needs to be someone who says we want to clear this up. 100%. Uh, there's a parity issue, that, we're, but, but this has to be resolved, and I trust in the UFT professionals uh, in their work and over 70,000 kids not having a healthcare professional is a very serious issue. The chancellor mentioned in his testimony that the protocol, as I asked him a question, if mm -hmm. a child reports not feeling well, what should the school do? He, he cited that the school should have someone designated to be with the child. Have you heard about this, and who is yeah. this designated person, and what is their expertise if they're not a nurse? Well, that's the issue is for the majority, almost the majority of our schools, they would have a nurse. And the nurse would then bring that child into an isolation room and do the procedures and checking certain things and then making the proper call of saying we need this child to go home or go to a healthcare professional, that we would leave to them to make that decision, and then all of the isolation protocols would kick in. I wanna be clear, when that type of stuff happens, that does not mean that child has the coronavirus. Right. Okay, this is just being precautionary. Okay? Right. So that is what would happen. When a school doesn't have a health professional, does from at this point in time, since you remember this, for all the years you worked in a school, the school has to figure it out on their own. Uh, and who will be that professional? Well, clearly they are not a healthcare professional. So that is one of the concerns is these 116 buildings that do not have that profession, that person in place. Who is gonna bring that child? That person would be wearing a gown. Uh, they would be wearing the uh, face guard with the gloves. At that point, are they supposed to take the temperature, mask the child, call the parent, bring the child home? If there's a nurse, it's pretty simple what to do. They'll know, they have the, they've been trained and they can take care of it. But at this point, you would have to ask the Department of Education. And, and I plan to, and the last thing I'll say to my back to the speaker, uh, in light of a lot of the anxiety, teachers from across the city of New York still conducted parent-teacher conferences the past yes. couple of nights. I want to give a big thank you to the amazing staff of our, our teachers, educators of our schools. They still met with parents, still do the job day and night. Thank so you so much I want to so give a shout out that. to the UFT for that. Thank and, you. Thank you very much. And it's my understanding that it was either today or yesterday had a higher school attendance among children from a year ago at the same day. So even in the midst of all of this, attendance is higher than the exact day one year ago, which shows that kids are still coming to school, schools are functioning, and people are going about their lives with listening to the, the facts, but still going about it. Charlie? I think the fact yeah. that we were all transparent, I mean, in our conversation starting a month ago, because we were doing a lot of work nationally at that point with the CDC, we were very clear with our members. It's not, it's not if, it's when. So we're gonna start getting all the facts and the information out, and we started doing that. And we think at this point, that is why we're, at the, we're in the position that we're in where people have that information. Things definitely could go 
and, and make a turn for the worse, and we will hopefully take the same spirit we've been doing this and do this work. But we'll wait and see where that goes. Chair Levine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, President Mulgrew. Thank you. Earlier, Chancellor Carranza spoke about the procedures when there is a sick child in the school who may have a fever or a cough that may be suspected as being coronavirus, and okay. that, that child would need to be sent home or to a medical provider. Um, but that could take a while, maybe, I don't know, an hour or two, that the child, as he explained it, would need to be isolated. In an isolation room. But that there would need to be an adult in the room. We didn't have time to question more about who that adult would be. Perhaps it could be a nurse, but there's not a nurse in every school, and uh, I'm getting a no from the nurses, so uh, it, 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 it might fall on, on one of your members, it might fall on a principal. Um, have you gotten any clarity on, on just how that critical period? We have asked for them uh, for more clarity on that particular situation. Right. To state the, the obvious, there would need to be appropriate protective gear for that such adult. Uh, much more than the standard surgical mask, the kinds of things that... It would not be a surgical mask. Correct. It would have to be the kind of personal protect, protective equipment that a medical professional would have, I presume, in a hospital setting, just to, to, to be as, as certain as possible that the adult is not at risk. The, the adult should be in a full medical gown, face shield, and gloves. Okay, well, we're going to work with you, if need be, to help clarify this and make sure that no adults are put in risk, at risk due to this critical function. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other questions from members? Uh, we're good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. And we all just have to remember to stay diligent as we move to t tackle this very difficult challenge. Thank you all. Thank you, President Mulgrew. We have, uh, we have uh, some more great union folks that are going to testify. Uh, we have uh, from uh, SEIU 1199, Nadine Williamson. Is Nadine still here? Great. Hey, Lily, how are you? Good, good to see you. We have uh, Annette, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Annette Sayi? Yes, come on up, Annette, to testify. We have Carol Wills. Yes, come on up, Miss Wills. We have Kim Thompson. Yes, these are all representatives from 1199. And then from 32BJ, we have Jordani Bueno. Yes, come on up, sir, to testify. So you all uh, are welcome. We're gonna get to the, uh, another panel next. Uh, Lily is on her way. Yes, come on up. So first of all, I, I want to thank you all because uh, your unions play a key role in New York City. You're the healthcare workers, so you are the folks that are on the front lines in hospitals and other uh, settings across New York City, taking care of people, and that is key. Uh, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, but especially in the midst of us being focused on something like this. So number one, from all the folks representing 1199, uh, thank you, and to thank you to all the members as well who play such a key and crucial role. From 32BJ, for the folks that you're representing here today, Mr. Bueno, uh, you all, the union uh, does a lot of things, but you also have school cleaners that are actually cleaning the schools. And you have folks that are handymen that are working inside the schools and in other facilities. So both of your unions are very, very key every single day, but especially as we talk about this issue. So let's start uh, uh, right here, and then we can work our way down the panel. Good afternoon. My name is Annette Say, and I work as a certified nursing assistant at Terrence Cardinal Cook, okay, which is also known as TCC. And I am a member of 1199 SEIU. I work strictly with HIV patients. My patients are both young and old and are very frail. To keep them healthy as possible, we take precautions. We wear gloves and masks, and if needed, we also wear gowns. Masks and hand sanitizer dispensers are available at the visitor's desk, um, by the elevators, on all the floors, and in the patient's room. TCC run, is run by ArchCare. There are two things that are very important. One is that management makes sure that every worker gets training on how to maintain a safe work environment, one where both the patients and the staff are safe, and they teach us that it is every staff member's responsibility to keep everyone safe. 
The other is that we have good benefits. I, if I am sick, I can call a doctor and I can get a doctor's note if I'm contagious and cannot go to work so as not to risk anybody else from getting sick and also my patients. I get a doctor's note and I can stay home until I get better. As healthcare workers, we, now, we know it is easy to spread colds, the flu, or a virus like the coronavirus. For the sake of every New Yorker's health, more needs to be done for people who do not have insurance and do not see a doctor in time to prevent spreading a virus. And for those who won't stay home because they are sick and afraid of losing their job. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Please. Okay. Good afternoon. Mr. Speaker, Chairperson, and other members of the Council, my name is Carol Wills. I'm a certified nursing assistant at the Terence Cardinal Cook Healthcare Center, known as CCC. I'm also a member of 1199 SEIU. As a CNA, I work with HIV patients who are prone to infections, whether it's the flu or any other virus. An important part of my job is to educate patients and their visitors about good hygiene, such as washing their hands when coming in from outside to avoid getting my patients sick. At TCC, to provide the best of care, we are careful to take precautions to keep patients safe. We wear latest gloves, gowns, and masks when needed. TCC is run by Arch Care. We are fortunate to have the support and cooperation of management who work with staff and provide the training needed to deal with potential epidemics. We have also started to get training on the coronavirus. Based on my interaction with patients and their visitors, I feel there needs to be more public awareness so that people understand the seriousness of the virus and what they need to do to prevent the spreading of it to others and to my patients. We need cohesive teamwork so that information can be disseminated in a timely manner as needed. Together, we can do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name's Stradani Bueno. I live in Upper Manhattan, and I have worked as a wheelchair agent at LaGuardia Airport for eight years. I'm here to thank you for standing with airport workers in our fight for New York State Healthy Terminals Act to ensure that airport workers can access health insurance during this public health crisis. My colleagues and I serve, monitor, and protect New York's critical infrastructure, its airports. The Port Authority tells us that to protect them from security threats, airports need a stable and experienced workforce. Workers like myself and my colleagues who know the ins and outs of JFK and LaGuardia, this is the reason we go through such rigorous background checks before getting hired. It's the reason the Port Authority raised our minimum wage in 2018 to reduce turnover and to retain experienced workers like me. Getting that raise made a huge difference in my life, but it left out something important, health insurance. I do not qualify for Medicaid, but I cannot afford the insurance offered by my employer. So today, I'm uninsured. Because of this, I know that any illness or injury could wipe out the economic gains I have won. I know this for, from personal experience as someone who suffers from epilepsy. In a year, I pay from my pocket over $1,000 for visits and medications, which I need to prevent another seizure. The last time I had a seizure, my ambulance, bill, my ambulance and hospital bills were a big financial shock to me. As a wheelchair agent, I'm always in direct contact with people who are sneezing, coughing. Sometimes I have to clean up bodily fluids from the wheelchair. I love my job, but this scares me. I know that airports are the main entry point for diseases like COVID-19. In 2014, there were uh, the main entry point for Ebola. It's even more likely that I could get the flu, which could send me home for weeks or even to the hospital. People like me without health insurance are less likely to get the flu vaccine. 
I care about my job. I care about making sure older passengers can get to their destinations and their families. I care that families know they are in good hands with me, but my job needs to take care uh, about me too. What this means is if I'm afraid uh, to visit a doctor because of the bill, what does this mean for my passenger's health if I can't get medical tests and exams during health crisis like COVID-19? COVID-19 is putting the spotlight on something that airport workers have known for decades. Airport workers need health insurance. The current situation is unjust and safe. The healthy terminals would provide access to insurance for thousands of airport workers without costing anything to the state. We need the state legislators to pass it now. I am grateful to the city council for holding this hearing today and taking leadership to protect New Yorkers from current public health threat. We ask that you continue to stand with airport workers in our fight for the Healthy Terminals Act. Thank you. Thank you very much, please. Good evening. My name is Kim Thompson and I'm a home health aide and a member of 1199. I am fortunate to have health care benefits and paid time off. My most recent client is an Alzheimer's patient who resides in Lower Manhattan. If I were to become ill, either from the flu or the coronavirus, it would be better for my client if I did not go to work. However, this is not easy. This is not an easy choice for everyone to make. Many workers do not get paid time off or have health benefits. So if they do not go to work, they do not get paid. They will sacrifice their health in order to pay rent and feed their families, meaning they'll go to work anyway knowing that they're sick and it jeopardizes the lives of others. In case of an outbreak, they would be spreading the virus to everyone that they come in contact with. There must be a system available to all workers who might encounter this situation. If we're sick, we should not have to worry about paying our rent and providing for our families, financially or medically, or losing everything that we work so hard for. You may only be quarantined for three weeks, but three weeks can become longer. People should not, have, should not be punished for becoming ill. And, uh, thank you, thank you. Th thank you very much. I just want to emphasize to, to all of you with the incredibly powerful statements from people who are on the front lines, who um, are protecting the vulnerable and, and who you yourselves and your colleagues are vulnerable. Um, I do want to point out for those who are not insured, thank goodness we have our public hospitals, which will treat everybody regardless of ability to pay, regardless of documentation status. So, um, and people who are unsure where to turn for free or affordable health care now can always call 311. They're set up to deal with coronavirus cases and others. Um, but I do want to thank all of you for your service on the front lines. And sorry, Lily, I I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. I will be reading the statement of Nadine Williamson, who is the executive vice president of our registered nurse division. We represent nurses and members in hospitals, nursing homes, and rehabilitation facilities where residents are already suffering from underlying conditions and are susceptible to viruses such as the flu and the coronavirus. As with the Ebola crisis and the H1N1 flu pandemic before that, we are working very closely with management to ensure that risks to workers are minimized and that quality care to patients is not negatively impacted. This is best accomplished by ensuring that workers receive proper training and have access to their necessary gear, such as gloves, masks, gowns, and to protect them and patients, as well as their respective families. As with any epidemic, the goal is to stop it from spreading. Currently, 21 members from a Westchester hospital who are members of 1199 are under home quarantine. Management is paying their salaries and continuing their health benefits. In contrast, a home care member is under home quarantine without pay. 
which would normally signal loss of health benefits. Fortunately, our home care benefit fund trustees jumped into action and they are taking uh, the necessary steps to extend health care benefits for any member required to be homebound or quarantined because of a virus, including coronavirus. In an epidemic resulting in a quarantine, particularly when such advice is documented by medical professionals, workers must be protected from job loss and economic hardship. We must recognize and address the reality that loss of income can prove catastrophic for many workers. Anything less will deter persons with symptoms from seeking medical care, at least in a timely manner. Um, another deterrent we must be aware of occurred at Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn, where immigration enforcement officers interfered with treatment and care of a patient. The presence of immigration enforcement um, officers in healthcare facilities will prevent people from seeking care when needed. Steps must be taken to ensure that New Yorkers feel safe from persecution when they visit a healthcare facility. 1199 and our employers will continue to work together to ensure that workers and patients are kept as healthy as they can be. We are at the ready to confront this and any other medical crisis that might arise. Thank you. Thank you, and I believe Councilmember Traeger has a question. I just a brief comments and just a brief question to, to the panel. First of all, I want to thank everyone who is testifying here today in your membership for your extraordinary work, not just during crisis times, but every day. Every day you're confronted with work to do, crisis big or small. Uh, with respect uh, to 32BJ and, and uh, the membership there, we thank you for your work and we, you heard the Chancellor before it mentioned that school cleaners and school staff are supposed to be supplied with all the resources they need uh, in terms to, in, to, to properly maintain school buildings. Um, if I, I just encourage folks to report to me and to in our office and to the council if that's not the case. So, uh, and we're c continuing to collect that information and also to provide overtime to cleaners to come in before and afterwards because you need to be compensated for the extraordinary work that you do. I just want to say on behalf of the children, staff of the school system, thank you for the incredible work that you do. And to our nurses, uh, I just want to share with you when we had a crisis in South Brooklyn with Hurricane Sandy, um, and our ER was destroyed by the storm. We didn't lose one life in Coney Island Hospital thanks to the outstanding members of 1199, the staff and the work there. We are eternally grateful for your work and sacrifice. Again, you deal with crisis big and small every day. To our home care, uh, nurses and aides and uh, folks, the most vulnerable population we hear, seniors, those with underlying health conditions, well, who's serving them every single day? Your members, you. Just want to say thank you and just continue to let us know how we could be helpful uh, to help you uh, any way we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yes. I just wanted to ask you very quickly whether in your individual capacities at hospitals or in the airport that you feel that you've been given all the information that you need, that you have the supplies that you need, and you understand how to protect yourself and the people that you serve. Actually, at, at Terrence Carmel Cook, we have in-service almost every week. Um, during the process or during the day, maybe every three or four days, there's always a supervisor coming by, preparing us with um, information, making sure we're up to date on everything that comes. So we're really prepared. All right, thank you to this panel. Oh, so, sorry. I don't want to put pressure on you, Mr. Bueno, but uh, they, they did very well. So. So, and I know you are all united. Yeah. Uh, in the airports, people are washing their hands frequently. They put the hand sanitizer around. And we recently took a training from, for uh, COVID-19, but with our union in an organization called Night Kosh. Mm -hmm. But not everybody was able to go. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm sure they'll be ongoing. I just want to thank you all also for, for serving such a diverse population of people and doing so with 100% commitment and love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to this excellent panel. And next up we have someone who I know is in, in a hurry, which is Jenna Mendelrici from the Greater New York Hospital Association. And we have a number of important labor leaders, including Jeff Oshins, president of Local 3005, 
Michael Greco, Vice President of Local 2507, and Nurse Judith Arroyo, President of Local 436. And if you want to kick us off, since we know you have to leave. Is your microphone on? There's a red button there. Now it is. Now you can hear me. Good evening, uh, Chair Rivera, Chair Levine, and members of the Committee on Hospitals and the Committee on Health. My name is Jenna Mandel Ricci, Vice President, Regulatory and Professional Affairs at the Greater New York Hospital Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, GNYHA proudly represents all hospitals in New York City, as well as hospitals throughout New York State, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. We augment our members' emergency preparedness and response efforts and serve as a conduit between the city, state, and federal governments and New York City's 55 911 receiving hospitals and additional specialty hospitals. Today, I will detail how hospitals have been preparing for COVID-19. New York City hospitals, as you heard from Dr. Katz, have strong systems in place to quickly identify and isolate patients who meet risk factors for any emerging infectious disease. These processes rely on clinical guidance provided by city, state, and federal health authorities that define a patient under investigation based on epidemiologic criteria. As guidance has changed over the last several weeks, hospitals and health systems have continuously updated triage, isolation, and testing procedures and protocols and ensured staff are appropriately trained, including the proper use of PPE. Given the importance placed on healthcare worker safety, the tightening of the healthcare supply chain has been troubling. Hospitals and health systems have been and continue to conserve supplies using a combination of strategies. When necessary, hospitals have also been drawing down from city and state emergency stockpiles. It is imperative that critical PPE supplies, such as N95 respirators, be prioritized for the healthcare workforce. Healthcare workers must be protected and feel protected in order to do their jobs effectively. Hospital leaders are also focused on staff availability. Under certain circumstances, as we heard earlier, if staff are exposed to an individual with confirmed COVID-19, either at work or outside of work, that staff person must be excluded for 14 days. Staff availability may also be compromised by ill family members, school closures, or an unwillingness to come to work due to fear. Many hospitals are actively working through staff contingency plans. Given workforce safety and staff availability concerns, hospital leaders are prioritizing communication with hospital staff using a variety of modalities to share critical information. To support these efforts, GNYHA is also collaborating closely with 1199 SEIU which represents healthcare workers in hospitals, long-term care facilities, and home care. Last week, when reports began to emerge of community transmission, New York City hospitals immediately and appropriately shifted toward the pandemic planning that you heard Dr. Katz describe earlier. This involves developing patient surge plans. The two areas of greatest concern are the emergency department and the availability of critical care beds. Government and hospitals must prevent EDs or emergency departments from becoming the front lines of this response. It is imperative that individuals with mild illness stay home and those with moderate illness seek care at their doctor's office, a primary care clinic, or an urgent care center, but as we've heard, they should call ahead. Only severely ill individuals should seek testing and care at hospitals. GNYHA and our member institutions are working with our partners in the city and state to consistently deliver this message to the public. Hospitals are developing alternative triage and screening strategies and spaces to make, meet anticipated increases in ED volume. And additionally, significant surge planning efforts are being devoted to increase the capacity of critical care units. It has been reported in the news that there are 1,200 beds in New York City to care for COVID-19 patients. This number refers to the estimated number of inpatient isolation rooms across New York City hospitals. Today, many of these rooms are occupied by patients in critical condition who may require isolation for a variety of reasons, including seasonal flu. However, hospital leaders are working through plans to surge these spaces in a number of ways or create new isolation spaces. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions after my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nurse Judith. Um, good evening, Council Member um, Levine, Rivera, and the rest of the committee. I am Judith Roy. I'm the president of the Local 436. 
This local represents public health nurses and the public health epidemiologists. The public health epidemiologists are the medical detectives that you keep referring to who are looking for that nexus and they're working very hard at it. In fact, a lot of them are working overtime to try to find it. The public health nurses have responded by going to the different provider centers, answering questions for doctors and, and, and uh, other healthcare professionals that may have issues. We've been doing that since the beginning of February. Now, I have to apologize, Councilman Levine, for my outburst before. 800 of those public health nurses that are now addressing this health emergency work in the New York City public school system, or rather in the school system in general. In answer to Council Member Traker's uh, questions, there are nurses in the non-public school, close to 196 of them. Uh, they are all public health nurses because only the Department of Health provides nurses to the non-public schools and to most of the charter schools. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head about the charter schools, but we are in the non-publics and we are in the charter schools. 800 <coughs> of our people are in the public school system and they have received all the information they need to do, to do what they have to do for the school system. However, I do echo President Mulgrew's issue about the nursing shortage in the school system. He cited 139 schools, but some of those schools that he thinks or knows have nurses are actually contract nurses. And we do have issues with contract nurses. For one thing, in answer to a question that you asked, no, they do not have access to the students' health records, neither the ones from the DOE or neither the ones from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The Office of School Health, the entire medical records for students in the, in the public schools are on what we call ASHER, Automated School Health Record. They do not have access to ASHER. It is in ASHER where either the DOE nurse or a Department of Health nurse puts in all the medical issues, including when the child walks in sick and what they did about it, all right? Um, so the issue of contract nurses is, no, they don't have access to the medical records and they cannot input into the computer, to, into ASHER, anything that they do. The other issue, and, and the nursing shortage does have to be addressed. Um, Local 436 statistics are that there are more than 139 schools. We're talking about maybe 200 or something. A lot of this happens to do with the parity issue that Council Member Traker brought up that has to be addressed and we hope to address it as we go into the future. My members have been calling in and saying they've had the information, though even those that work in the call center and everything else, the public health nurses in the schools have their information. They're saying they need more information out there to the public. Um, to quote one of my members, she says this, she went through the HIV crisis when it first hit, the AIDS epidemic, and it reminds her of people coming in and asking about toilet seats. During the AIDS epidemic, people were saying, can you catch AIDS from sitting on the toilet seat? She says there's too much myth, there's too much misinformation, and while I'm glad to hear that the Department of Health is going to put out a lot of digital media, subway and, and bus media, um, my members feel that we would be more effective with a person to person, sending out folks to PTA meetings, to the senior care centers, uh, a health professional to speak to groups of people where the community can ask questions. In fact, you could probably in your own districts arrange for a healthcare professional, either from the Department of Health or Health and Hospital to come at any of your events that you hold in your district to speak and to answer questions. Usually when people can confront or speak 
face to face with a healthcare professional, they feel better. And yes, we are telling them to go to their primary care physicians, but folks want a second opinion or they want to hear from somebody such as the public health nurses, the nurse practitioner, the doctors, the ones that are actually dealing with the issue, they want to hear from them and, and feel that, okay, this sounds good, we're, we're fine. Yes, and of course, we do need more dollars for this. The overtime is um, quite large. My members are working two shifts. They're either working in their regular clinics, the schools, um, doing their home visits, and then they leave and go work in the call centers, um, answering questions from the providers, trying to make sure that only those that need to be tested will be tested, and it's a double shift. And the shifts run until one o'clock in the morning. And uh, the Department of Health to assure the safety of our members has said that they can take a car service home and they will be reimbursed. But these are all expenses that have to be taken care of into. So as our civic leaders, I know in the past you have done this, where you have worked with our congressional delegations, with our state, uh, senators and assembly people, and I'm hoping that, uh, as you've done in the past, you will um, help in trying to get more money for addressing this crisis. And uh, thank you for listening to the testimony. Again, I apologize. The outburst is because a lot of people do want the nurse in the school to be the designated person, but that doesn't work. There are other children in the school. She's got diabetics and everybody else, so that's the reason why. Uh, thank, no, thank you for explaining and clarifying that. Uh, it was a justifiable outburst. <laughs> and we're happy to have you elaborate here in the testimony. Thank you. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> just for the record, um, my name is uh, Jeff Oceans. It's not Oceans. And I just want to say good evening, council members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify tonight. My voice is not the best, so I will certainly try to do my best as well in testifying. I do represent the members of Local 3005 or 3005. We are the technical and professional employees of the New York City Health Department and OCME. It is my members that are actually working at the public health labs that are conducting these tests. I was quite astonished to hear that we are only having a thousand tests that can be done. And when I heard, not per day, but in total, that was like, excuse my language, freaking crazy, because I don't understand how we can go ahead and have countries in, in Asia and in parts of the Middle East where they can go ahead and do 10,000 tests a day, and we are still very limited. Now, we now know that as this, and for the first time I heard Dr. Katz mention the word pandemic, I don't think anyone has yet really classified it yet as a pandemic until I heard it tonight. The federal government hasn't done it yet, and we have our president who's in his own little crazy world at half the time. So right now, I just want to okay. let you know that um, as we could expect the number of cases to come up and we need to get people tested, we're certainly going to need to know that we are going to have people working. As a labor leader and an advocate in the labor movement for over 28 years, I am definitely against outsourcing and contracting out jobs. Our people that are working in the labs that are actually also working at the call center, they are going to be asked, and I am now getting emails, how are we going to be being paid for doing any overtime? They are being activated and they are then being considered involuntary versus voluntary. This is creating a little bit of confusion at this time, so we certainly could support well, we do need the support of the city council leadership to help us find money so that we don't have to continue on figuring out how are these people going to be continue on being paid when they are working these overtime hours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, good evening, uh, council members. Um, it's 6.30 at night and uh, I've done a bunch of these so I do appreciate all of you staying late as well. Um, to go back to the beginning of all this, uh, first off, I'm Michael Greco. I'm the vice president of Local 2507. We represent the FDNY EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. So I came here just to kind of hear the preparations that they were putting in place and to figure out whether or not I would speak 
over the preparations of my EMTs and paramedics. Um, we've been up here a bunch of times explaining the overworked, the conditions of FDNY EMS. I heard the word pandemic today as well, and um, I do appreciate the council members and the commissioner really trying to bring this back into reality by giving some facts of how bad this currently is or how bad it can get. What I would caution is, thankfully, it's not as bad. It's a little worse than the flu right now. So standard washing your hands, making sure ambulances, everything is clean, that is helpful. But what is very alarming is if this was Wuhan, China, and if we did have 80,000 cases, I'm not sure if we're prepared enough at least on the front lines, first responder, ambulance area, where we're already doing 5,000 calls a day. We're doing 1.5 million calls a day. So if you were to add another half a million calls in a year for a pandemic like that, you would overwhelm the system to the point of crippling nature. Our members do not have unlimited sick. As a first responder in a pandemic, to know that if you do respond to a suspected case, right now they are allowing or ordering two weeks of self-quarantine. We have four members who came back from one of the affected countries, and they are currently on a two-week uh, quarantine. We appreciate- are, are they burning through sick days for that? That's what I was gonna say. Right. No, we appreciate that those members are being paid as non-chargeable leave. Right now, there is nothing set up that if we respond to a job and we catch this virus or we have to be quarantined, there's nothing set up that says we are gonna be covered or use our own sick time. We get 12 sick days a year. So that's one thing I wanna address, I wanna make sure. Now we had two calls in the past 24 hours where members stayed on scene for an hour and a half and two and a half hours dealing with the telemetry doctors, the CDC, uh, the Department of Health, over whether or not to transport a patient. Now we're in our isolation precautions, we have the N95s, but anybody knows that an N95 is only good for 20 to 40 minutes, depending on how long and what your interaction is. We carry four in an ambulance. Right now we're rationing our N95s because we have 400 ambulance out there, so if you do the math, that's 1,600 N95s you need at any given time, and the world right now is begging for N95s. So we wanna make sure of a couple of things. One, that we are covered if we happen to catch or suspected of transporting. We wanna be quarantined if possible and make sure we get paid. So that's our number one priority. The second priority is Right now, stats in the first responder world are very important. How long does it take you to respond to a job? How long are you on scene of a job? How long are you at the hospital? And now out of service times. Uh, ops guide procedure was written that standard decon procedures apply, which means you wipe down the ambulance with bleach wipes um, and they should be air dried for 10 minutes. That's gonna increase our out of service times, which it should, because you should be going to every call with a clean, freshly stocked, if we're worrying about spreading a, a possible pandemic. So we want the procedures put into place that that time should be given and not have our members being feared of rushing or doing that sort of stuff. But there's a cause and effect. If we're already running behind on numbers and now you're taking units out of service, it goes back to what I've been up here before talking about. We are understaffed, we are underpaid. It's another situation where FDNY EMTs and paramedics are first responders, uniform members, who are now being shortchanged when it comes to being taken care of. So I just wanna make sure that once again, if money is gonna be allocated, I hear the government, federal government is releasing $8.6 billion. Public education on 911 usage should be the one of the main focuses. If you have a sniffle, seek a primary care physician, seek your normal course of getting treatment, stay at home. What happens is in the underserved communities, the primary care physician is the ERs. And we have to find a way to limit that call volume because as they stated, 80% are non-symptomatic. 
So people are gonna call with a random symptom and we're not gonna know. So people are gonna get sick. I think a lot of that money should be spent on public education to know when to call 911 during this pandemic and during every other time. Because we do get calls for stubbed toes, we get calls for 25 year olds with the sniffles and they go to the hospitals. If we have 1200 beds, they get a bed for a little while, it takes up that point. So. We thank you for your time. I'm available for any questions uh, you may have. Excellent. Thank, thank you. All right. Um, oh, I just wanted to say this is exactly why we brought the administration, these agencies together, because of things that your first responders are going through, everyone in our hospital system, and um, knowing that I know it's um, – they mention the word pandemic, but we're, we're at a point where, just, just to be clear, we're, we're not there yet, but we are at a point where we have to prepare for the worst case scenario. And mentioning the kits, I think that's something that other countries are producing far more in less time. So I know that the capability is there. We just have to be organized around it. So I just want to thank you for taking okay. the time and testifying. Thank you so much for your patience, too. No problem. Thank you for having us. And I take the subway every day, and I'm still taking the subway. So as a medical professional, you wash should. your hands, keep showing up, and I'll tell that to anybody I speak to. Do everything you normally do. As well, you should. All right. Hopefully you'll tweet that out so New Yorkers can be inspired. <laughs> yeah, and I hope they listen. I, I, I want to thank everyone on this panel and let you know that we, we are really committed, certainly Chair Rivera and I are extremely committed to making sure that the people on the front lines have the support, the resources, the protection that they need. And it's not too soon to start planning for a much more serious uh, pandemic than we're currently facing. And, um, and you know that, that hospitals are at the center of this crisis under any scenario. Um, and we want to make sure that you have the support of the city uh, to meet the needs uh, of New Yorkers in this medical crisis. So thank you all for testifying. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to call the next panel, Gabe Oberfield, Nancy Rankin. Oh, yeah, Nancy. Sorry, sorry, Nancy. Sorry about that. Kelly Sabatino, Reed Vreeland. Oh, Susan Duha. Thank you very much and good evening. Um, appreciate the time, uh, both uh, Chair Rivera and Chair Levine and members of the council. Um, we are delighted to be here. I'm Gabriel Oberfield, Senior Vice President of uh, Policy and Operations for the Continuing Care Leadership Coalition. And I very much appreciate this opportunity to testify. Uh, for those unfamiliar, CCLC is a trade association that represents not-for-profit and public long-term care providers throughout New York City and in the broader metro region. And our members provide the full continuum of long-term long care services, excuse me, including skilled nursing care, home health care, adult day health care, and notably care for special populations such as those delivered at TCC. Arch Care is one of our members. Um, CCLC deeply values its close working relationship with the Greater New York Hospital Association as well. And this testimony will address three key points. CCLC members and the broader New York City long-term care community have worked to deepen their preparedness capacities over time, and these efforts put New York City on improved footing to fight COVID-19. Second, CCLC furnishes its membership and related stakeholders with critical information from relevant agencies and healthcare leadership, positioning them to keep their patients and residents safe and to contribute to response efforts. And then third, because of COVID-19 specific risks for older adults and those with underlying vulnerabilities, we must keep New York City's long-term care community well supplied and resourced while also recognizing 
the group's clinical strengths, thus allowing hospitals and health systems, as my colleague Jenna Mandel Ricci mentioned, to focus on the most critically ill. So it's important to note that for a generation, CCLC has held key operational and liaison relationships with governmental partners, including both New York City and New York State's Department of Health and those jurisdictions' um, offices of emergency management. Um, and CCLC has worked closely um, as well with DOHMH to implement a multi-pronged and applied curriculum to boost the broader long-term care sector's emergency preparedness knowledge and capacities which has integrated the sector more deeply into the city's preparedness and response fabric. As examples, CCLC-led emergency preparedness conferences and tabletop exercises have involved all of New York City's approximately 170 nursing homes for five years running, and those activities have tested abilities to tolerate coastal storm surge, cybersecurity threats, supply chain limitations, among other challenges. We believe this work has strengthened long-term care providers for moments like the very one we're facing. And CCLC members, it's important to note, are receiving regular updates from CCLC as the situation unfolds, typically through timely email, often including content that the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene recommends that we highlight. Indeed, at CCLC's meeting of its board of directors on Tuesday morning, a CDC officer assigned to DOHMH's senior leadership presented on COVID-19 considerations to CCLC's board, and throughout, CCLC has been directing members' requests for additional PPE by communicating closely and regularly with NYSEM and other partners. Let me just close with these following thoughts. Um, we're very heartened that many public health and elected officials recognize the critical role and important competencies of long-term care providers, and we ask for the Council's continuing support to ensure long-term care settings are acknowledged as key and capable components of our citywide response. We're confident that the sector has prioritized preparations, is working to conserve resources, and critically is focused on assuring the safety of their residents and the directed healthcare workers, many of whom were just here before me, who care for them. The group is equipped to navigate moments like this through deep experience with influenza and other complex illness, but your help is appreciated because they are doing so with tight budgets that they must stretch daily. On behalf of CCLC, thank you very much for this time, and I'm happy to take any question. Uh, good evening. I want to thank um, the speaker, uh, Corey Johnson, and committee chairs Levine and committee chair Rivera for holding this important hearing. Um, this evening on the city's preparations for the coronavirus. My name is Nancy Rankin. I'm vice president for policy research and advocacy at Community Service Society of New York. As we prepare for coronavirus, ensuring people have health coverage is obviously very important. But having a Medicaid or insurance card in your hand is not enough. Um, workers also need to be able to take paid sick leave, as we heard earlier. One of the main recommendations from the um, CDC for preventing the spread of coronavirus and of seasonal flu, for that matter, is to stay home from work when you're sick, to keep your sick child home from school. And you certainly heard this um, advice from the health commissioner earlier. Fortunately, most employees in New York City have the right to paid sick days thanks to the law passed by the City Council in 2013 and expanded twice since then. Our law is very strong. It explicitly allows paid sick time to be used if a person's place of business, your child's school or daycare is closed due to a public health emergency. So that's the good news. The bad news is that too many low-income workers are unaware of their rights. Um, Community Service Society's 2019 survey of New York City residents that was conducted with a professional polling firm, Lake Research, found that 60% of low-income workers covered by our law had heard little about it, including 42% who had heard nothing at all about it and lack of awareness hinders enforcement since it's largely driven by worker complaints. 
We thank Council Member Levine for introducing Intro 1797, a bill that would create an ongoing informational campaign to raise awareness of workers' rights under New York City's Earn Safe and Sick Time Act. And I thank Council Member Rivera for being co-sponsor. Um, the city would distribute posters for voluntary display at pharmacies, hospitals, and other health care locations throughout the city, reminding people that in New York City, employees do have the right to paid sick leave. This is a very simple, very low cost, effective, and timely way to raise awareness of the right to paid sick leave. Um, and widespread posters would also raise awareness among employers and the general public, making it harder for the most vulnerable workers to be denied their rights. And in all the discussion that we've been having today and, and a lot of the, um, uh, aware, the, the information being put out, it would be great to see the council and the mayor um, reminding people that when they're telling them to stay home when they're sick and keep sick kids home from school, that in New York City we do have a right to pay sick days. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much uh, to Council Member Rivera and Council Member Levine and Speaker Johnson for the opportunity to appear here before you today. I'm from the Center for Independence of the Disabled in New York. Sydney, in the last year we reached more than 50,000 New Yorkers. We are the leading advocate for people with disabilities and have been for more than 40 years. We work with individuals to educate them, to help them meet their goals in life, to, and we educate the public to develop a deeper understanding of disability. Uh, we also speak with policymakers about the barriers that impede progress for people with disabilities. Um, currently, in New York City, there are more than 800,000 people with disabilities living in their own housing, living in an apartment just like you, next door to you, uh, just like everyone else, not congregate settings, which were spoken of by the Department of Health. Um, these are people who do not necessarily go to senior centers or adult day programs. Um, some of them work and in fact work for us as the majority of the people on our board and our staff are people with disabilities, including people with chronic health conditions. Um, on our board and on our staff we have people with disabilities who are immune suppressed and who have the conditions, the secondary conditions that occur at a higher rate for people with disabilities than they do for the non-disabled public. There are health disparities population. So for example, some of the conditions discussed at putting people at higher risk for COVID-19 um, are also more prevalent among people with disabilities like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, immunosuppression. Um, our, our workers work with uh, people who are in homeless shelters to help them find housing. We work with people who are in nursing homes as the long-term care ombuds program in order to ensure their safety from abuse, neglect, and the quality of care that they receive. Um, we are concerned about the lack of guidance for people with disabilities who are dwelling in the community and who are at higher risk. Um, in Washington State, they've issued guidance now that is telling people who are at higher risk for serious illnesses um, to go home and stay away from people. Uh, we're, we're open to guidance short of that we would imagine advice for those working, 30% 30 per, 30 of people with disabilities are working, to uh, telecommute, to do meetings by phone, by email, uh, other technological solutions, uh, to stop in-person appointments in people's homes, um, or in other locations where they may encounter more people who are at higher risk. 
uh, we are, of course, advising them about all of the precautions that are uh, told to the general public to engage in, um, but we would rather exercise an abundance of caution. We feel we have an obligation to our staff and the people we serve who have chronic conditions to ensure that they have advice that gives them the maximum protection for their health. Um, we also would like to talk about the city's response in terms of accessibility of information. We've not been able to find materials in alternate formats for people who are blind or low vision, and ASL interpreters are not being used in educational opportunities, nor, it, nor is the uh, technology cart. Um, these would be very helpful. Also, captions running under uh, the commissioner when she is speaking would be very helpful. Relying on YouTube captions is very unreliable. They're very inaccurate. Um, we want to make sure that if the incidence of COVID-19 um, worsens and we find ourselves in an epidemic, in a pandemic, that uh, we try to avoid having people with disabilities segregated in institutional settings or segregated in community um, residences that may crop up when hospitals are overloaded, et cetera. Um, we want uh, people with disabilities to be treated uh, in a way that comports with their civil rights under federal, state, and city laws. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Chair Rivera and uh, committee council for hearing me today. Uh, my name is Reed from Housing Works. Um, I'm actually gonna testify um, very briefly on something I did not expect to testify at all about today, um, but was inspired by uh, some of the earlier uh, testimony. Um, so I'm a person living with HIV uh, for 34 years and actually grew up living with HIV um, in New York City, um, and I have also uh, been cured of Hep C and uh, lived through, got swine flu a few years ago, and so multiple epidemics. Um, but I wanted to bring your attention to one thing that I didn't hear a lot of about today, which is um, how young people who might get COVID-19 uh, might be treated and stigma relating to that. Um, and making sure DOE has um, some kind of policy and guidance around stigma, um, making sure that uh, teachers are prepared um, on you know, how to deal with prejudice um, and racism related to COVID-19. These are things that often uh, teachers just aren't necessarily conversations that they're prepared to have. Um, so as someone, when I was young, uh, dealt with, um, you know, classmate teasing or, uh, you know, literally had to leave a camp I was at. So, you know, this will happen um, if it gets much worse and we really should have the materials in place to educate uh, DOE um, and, and teachers, et cetera. Um, I came here today actually to um, bring the city council's attention to what Governor Cuomo is doing on um, at the state level on the health budget. Um, so I'll speak very briefly to that. Um, Governor Cuomo last year cut 65 million from the New York City uh, matching health fund through Article 6. So that's 65 million dollars less that New York City has um, for our health system. He's also trying to pass $1.1 billion um, in Medicaid costs, shift that to New York City, which will very much devastate our health budget. Um, we really need the city to fight back against these state uh, cuts to our city's health system. And in addition, uh, there's what's happening right now is uh, the governor appointed a Medicaid redesign team um, which does not include any members of H&H, &H, any members of DOHMH. Um, it doesn't include um, very many uh, advocates um, covered by Medicaid or um, people with disabilities. 
Um, the city uh, estimates that 140,000 people with disabilities um, in New York City alone will be affected by potential cuts um, through pass through the MRT, which is not democratic process. Um, so we really, a lot of advocates have been drawing attention to what the governor's trying to do with these Medicaid cuts, um, but we need some muscle from the council um, to put pressure on your counterparts in the assembly and Senate to fight back. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I feel like we're, you know, we went through this last year with Article 6 cuts as well. So I will be right back on the steps or wherever I have to be to make sure that we stop the cuts to Medicaid. And in terms of the DOE policy around stigma and bullying, I'm not sure if anyone is left here from the administration, but we will be sure. I, I know that they wanted to cover this. We just didn't have enough time um, about that. And, and also, one of the first questions I asked h and &H was around P P individuals with chronic illnesses and people with disabilities. And I, I kind of feel like the answer was we're working on it, but I, I didn't really hear anything. And, and so I thank you for bringing it up again. I'm so sorry. I was so gratified to hear your questions, but I felt you did not get answers, quite honestly. Um, they referred back to people who were in nursing facilities or in other congregate settings, ignoring the fact that 800,000 of us are living in the community with immunosuppression, diabetes, and other conditions. Um, and we really desperately need that information. We need it right now. Thank you, and thank you for the reminder of the paid sick leave. I think that's so important, and for all your policy work. Thank you to the panel. Thank you very much. And with that, extra credit for the last panel, um, Carlin. Carlin come from Chinese American Planning Council. Mira. Venel, oh yes, yes, Mira, hello. From our friends at the Asian American Federation. And again, please feel free to correct me. Um, Sungun Chun. Joel Kupferman. Dusty Burke. Okay. I can be very rude and leave right after this because I am very late to a meeting. <laughs> um, Don't worry about it. I just you appreciate so. you waiting this long and, and that you're testifying. No. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and holding this hearing today. Um, thank you especially for staying through to the bitter end. I'd like to begin by noting that I am concerned that no one from the administration is is here at this point when the community-based organizations and particularly the uh, Asian American panelists to testify are the ones that are left on the last panel. The administration is not here to, to hear our testimony. Um, CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council, serves Asian American immigrant and low-income community members throughout New York City. And we are glad to hear that the city is being proactive and that the council is being proactive in preparing for this public health epidemic. I won't speak to that because everybody has already discussed, but I do want to highlight a few things first in order to make sure that our community-based organizations are prepared to deal with this. We have seen um, differing guidance from city agencies, so making sure that guidance is clear to community-based organizations, there is a clear um, contact to follow up on procedure, and then also um, that any guidance or mandates is funded for those contracted social services agencies is critical. I have these recommendations in my um, testimony, but then secondly, we are seeing a lot of um, anti-Asian American bias and racism um, that I have not heard discussed a lot today. I'd like to share a couple of observations that we've already seen from our community members. We have had small businesses that have reported a decline in business of over 50% have had to lay off workers and have said that if this continues for the next couple of weeks, they will be shutting down. 
We had a fire recently at 70 Mulberry and we've had to move our seniors over to our administrative center. Our neighbors have complained that those seniors are now congregating around in public areas because they are concerned about the spread of coronavirus. We have already heard of incidents of bullying in school of young children, um, of community members being bullied on the subways and in public places. This is a very real consequence of um, any kind of fear-based xenophobia and racism that we're already seeing the consequences of. And so we want to really encourage the city and the council to take that seriously, to be proactive about it, and to keep that in mind as we make preparations. Thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning what our Asian American Asian community is going through, especially with the attacks, the racism, the abandonment of the businesses, and we're trying our best at the council to work on that. So thank you. I know you have to go. I just wanted to thank I'm you. I'm very for sorry. Testimony. No, don't apologize. It's it's okay. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sangan Chen, and I'm the senior manager of health policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you to committee chairs Mark Levine and Carlina Rivera and all members of the Committee on Health and Hospitals for the opportunity to submit this testimony. I want to say a special thanks to Carlina Rivera for your statement in mid-February encouraging New Yorkers to fight back against coronavirus and prejudice. We at the NYC are thankful to New York City and New York State officials urging New Yorkers to stay calm and address coronavirus as a public health issue that it is. This is in stark contrast to the Trump administration, which is calling for closure of the southern U.S. border and relying on antiquated lies about immigrants. The implementation of public charge comes at the worst possible time as fear and confusion unnecessarily drives families away from needed health services to serve Trump's racist and classist agenda. This is a time when our immigrant communities need to be encouraged to get the health services they need regardless of immigration status. In New York City, fear and, and disinformation have led to real consequences for our immigrant communities, including physical attacks, plummeting business at Chinese restaurants, and racist bullying against Asian students. Even the media is perpetuating stereotypes and anti-immigrant sentiment. The fear of contracting coronavirus has an ugly cousin, xenophobia, which I have been a recipient of as a passenger on the subway, as a parent, and as a caretaker to my elderly immigrant parents. Riding the subway has been a hostile experience. Just two days ago during my morning commute, I had a white woman glaring at me when I sneezed. She muttered a racial slur telling me to go back to where I came from. This incident reminded me yet again on the devastating impact that anti-Asian racism has on immigrant communities living in fear with the onset of public charge, ISIS questionable activity in a Brooklyn hospital that is preventing them from seeking the care they need because of their immigration status. We urge council offices and administration to be proactive as voices of common reason on the public, public health front and on speaking out against xenophobia. We ask the council to urge the DOE to ensure that schools are prepared to rapidly share urgent information with immigrant families in the event of school closure. We also urge the city to ensure that DOHMH absolutely includes their anti-stigma message in all their fact sheets, campaigns, emails, and posters to counter misinformation. Council members are the trusted sources and have a huge role to play in calming the public. We ask that you help to stop the spread of coronavirus by, enc by encouraging New Yorkers to take public health precautions, not perpetuate racist stereotypes. Thank you for the opportunity to share this testimony. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry for your experience, but I thank you for sharing it so thank you. we can see what the average person is going through today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Um, I would like to thank Chair Rivera and Oh, just please Levine. press. Oh, sorry. Um, I would like to thank Chair Rivera and Chair Levine, and for you especially for staying to the bitter end. <laughs> um, I represent, I'm the Communications and Development Manager for the Asian American Federation, and we, I'm here today to speak on behalf of our 70 member agencies who serve you know, in many ways, over 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. Um, so I would like to say that we are deeply concerned about the impacts that we are seeing on our uh, communities. 
and it had literally has reached into our agency in the sense our one of our interns was you know somebody was walking by and she sneezed and they told her to go back to her country and 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 said all kinds of things to her and so we are we are seeing this every day but i would like to especially talk to what we are seeing, the economic impacts with our, we have an economic development program in Flushing and our merchants have, don't know what to do with the devastating, dev devastating economic impacts they're seeing. Business has been lost to about 50%. Um, there's a cascade effect because then now restaurants are telling workers to stay home. They have to cut their hours. So then they are going back, they don't have money to feed their families. So we are seeing economic impacts across the board. And you know, this is interesting because in, in our own report in, from 2000 to 2012, we found that about half of net new economic activity and half of net new employment was driven by Asian small businesses in the, in the city. So, with this xenophobia and racism and the shutting down of, of Asian businesses, what we are seeing is that this is going to affect e the economic engine of New York City itself. And um, we, as a community, are not prepared for this kind of devastating effects because one in four Asian Americans live in poverty. We have 50% you know, of uh, low English proficiency and to about what, what we are seeing is that we need to ha somehow deal with this and talk to these two Asian Americans in languages that they understand because of low English proficiency. And the fear and confusion around it is also interfering with the services that we, that nonprofits are providing to these, um, to the people that we serve. So for instance, we ha wanted to have a meeting around um, the, electric bike delivery workers, we, because that's the advocacy that we do. And nobody wanted to come because people are scared to come into areas because they don't understand what exactly the COVID-19 is doing. And so we would like the um, council to establish some kind of system of delivering frequent multilingual communications and resources to immigrants and immigrant serving organizations, one. We'd also like elected officials and staff to participate in mandatory training on racial sensitivity and cultural humility. Because we are seeing that some of these <laughs> xenophobic statements are not only coming from the media, you know, they always show a picture of like an Asian person, <laughs> even though, you know, the persons who have been affected by coronavirus is not actually Asian in New York City. But, um, and we would like that the city encourage elected leaders and community members to speak about this issue in calm, clear, and compassionate terms, and to promptly denounce instances of anti-Asian rhetoric and violence. And we would like that there is some kind of additional funding for Asian-serving community organizations to cover the following emergency needs. Conducting health screenings, hold informational sessions and increase rapid response capacity because we are the trusted frontline. We are the trusted community um, organizations that people come to. You know, they, they don't actually go to government agencies. They come to us and they ask for um, answers. And so we are the ones on the front line. And then, you know, cleaning equipment and services. Like we have seen that there are community organizations that are anyway under-resourced have been actually buying medical supplies for themselves and their staff because they are dealing with seniors. They are meeting members of the public and they don't want anything to happen where either they are transmitting something or they are you know, getting some, some kind of maybe the virus or whatever. They're just trying to be very um, careful about that and they're spending their own money. So there's a loss of revenue due to fear and quarantine, and we'd like some amount of appropriations for cleaning equipment, for being able to, God forbid, the virus actually starts affecting people so that we can continue our work from home, so have you know, some laptops or whatever we, that's required. So we would also like that the rules on city contract deliverables be relaxed because people are not going to be able to meet 
the, the deliverables because there are, clients are not coming to the centers. Um, and one last thing, we are one week away from the census. And there are, I mean, you know, we are a census information agency. We are on the core committee of the census. And we are, there is never, this is the worst time to deal with the health crisis. And, and we are the, on the eve of the most critical civic participation event in a decade. And we are trying to encourage community interaction and engagement. And AF is running various scenarios on what to do, on how to best work under these circumstances and the nonprofit communities on the front line, and we need help to protect our community, but also to protect ourselves in order to continue to do what we do best, which is serve our communities. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you for staying. Thank you. I'm Joel Kupferman from the Environmental Justice Initiative, the National Lawyers Guild Environmental Justice Committee. And I think it's not ironic, but I sat here 20 years ago after 9-11 in front of the health committee trying to sh tell them of what we found in the samples that we grabbed. And the health committee basically did this for a long time. And we brought more and more evidence. And what the word kept on coming up is that they didn't want to alarm anybody. I think it's important to, to decide what's alarming and what's fact. The city health department now, I think, gave you a very bad understatement of the risk assessment that's what's happening. We're way behind what Washington State is doing and what California is doing. There's children in, in um, Liverpool that has been diagnosed with the virus. So just telling us that no children have been affected is, 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 is misleading and, and false. We were the attorneys for the firefighters union after 9-11. The city gave very, very bad response protecting those firefighters. You heard from the ambulance drivers today do you know that New York City, New York City, we still have ambulances where there's diesel exhaust coming back into the cab affecting those drivers? We have an integrated health delivery system that the city has not been following through. Um, what they're telling us is just to say no to the virus, or, and we're ignoring that, that, that curve that's happening all over the place, um, is over an emphasis on, on preventing alarm, and I think it's time that we've op totally opened up the truth that's, that's out there. And also in terms of hospitals, there's been legionnaires caught, it's been, it's been um, diagnosed in Columbia Presbyterian and other hospitals. A lot of the hospitals that we have here are facing violations. They're not up to, up to snuff. So I think that's one of the most important things that we have to do. And also high-level doctors and quite a few different institutions have told us that not all the workers in those hospitals are trained. We're really concerned about the food preparation workers. It just takes one or two people to, to, uh, um, to basically get sick. And also, we, part of the problem with the worker protection is there's no discussion so far about penalties for employers that don't allow these policies to take place. And also, I just want to say, I represent two tenant associations at NYCHA residents. When there's Legionnaires outbreak in St. Nick's in Harlem, the city health department came along and just said, it's only in three different buildings, it doesn't follow the criteria, so we're not gonna do any follow-up. We're concerned that when also for the last five, six years, when many NYCHA residents have called the city health department, they're told that 311 system does not cover them. I'm really concerned, and people are concerned, that all those one in 14 city residents, or NYCHA residents, that they're basically gonna be ignored. And now we're relying on a NYCHA that is it's totally ignored their, their, their health service. So, and also in terms of the health department and hospitals and corporation, we were heavily involved with Hurricane Sandy recovery. When they closed the hospital in Far Rockaway, it was basically left with one licensed nurse to take care of all of those people um, on, on the, on, 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 down in the Rockaways, people were facing insulin shock because there was no delivery of insulin. At the same time, there was hundreds of nurses that were being paid in Bellevue because Bellevue had lost the electric due to, due to the storm. So I think it's very important for city council 
to look at the mismanagement that health and hospitals and the health department has done all these years. And just one more thing I, th I really um, appreciate. After 9-11, the city health department was a violator of this something called the New York State Occupational Lung and Disease Registry. Anyone that was affected by that 9-11 dust should have been reported to that state registry. And the health department did, did not do that. When we got hit with the West Nile virus spraying, we had people call up the city health department to complain of the adverse effects. The city health department told those people, you can't get hit or hurt by the spray that took place. So I think it's incumbent upon you to listen to other people other than the city health commissioner and health and hospitals and say that everything is rosy. And, and I really suggest the size of the budget that's out there, that city council hire your own assessors, your own health assessment people to, to give you more materials to fight back when, they, when we're just hearing it from one side. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I just want to um, clarify, I know that they said that children were not a part of the higher risk populations. I think what happened was the chancellor said that the virus doesn't like children, and I think he, I think that kind well, of. Well, uh, well, that's what they said about the World Trade Center dust when they're trying to tell us the asbestos was below the 1%, even people are getting hit. This is the city health department. No, no, that I used, understand. But when you say anything about children, mm -hmm. the city health department up until last year used Roundup in playgrounds. This is a city health department that we're all trusting to tell us that which, which children are vulnerable or not vulnerable to. So I agree that children might no, be no, less I, vulnerable. And I understand. Hold on, I just want to finish what I'm saying. Okay. Is that I want to make sure that we are, you know, we're trying to highlight the facts in this hearing. I am on a bill to ban the use of Roundup. I understand also 311 and the CCC in responding to NYCHA tenants is not is not a system that is currently working. And in fact, today I was a little disappointed that we did not get to cover our NYCHA families. And that is a very large public system that deserves a lot of care. And so I think, um, you know, as is mentioned in, in testimony here, that disasters are always inclusive, but response and recovery are not, unless we plan for it. So with that, I just want to make sure that we get to our last panelist. Thanks. Hi. My name is Dusty Burke, and I'm with Westview News, which you probably know. George Capps is our publisher. We're looking at uh, putting out a mid-month special edition really just on coronavirus mm -hmm. and uh, offer solutions and really do a positive thing. I trained with FEMA to be a continuity manager for mass casualty and pandemic preparedness and I was training with the top people during the Ebola outbreak and so I understand all that. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is a document from the Defense Threat Reduction Agency that I found. You can see it's pretty well researched. And in this, they looked at the 1918 flu pandemic to see what are some of the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we can use. And they looked at these different communities, um, provisional escape communities. And the one thing they did, which I found, which is really cute, is this, in Yerba Buena Island, not one person got sick. Or, um, or passed away, well, everyone in San Francisco was dying. Well, what the military did was they quarantined the island and they sprayed the men's throats with a colloidal silver. And if you wanted to get on the island, they sprayed your throat four times a day in quarantine and for four days, and then they put you in with the general population. And they did this in all of these military bases uh, that are listed in this, in this study. And it's something, it's an over-the-counter. You can go to the health food store. If you think you got a cold, a scratchy throat, they're telling people it's misleading. They're saying there's nothing you can do besides mass quarantine and social distancing. There's high-dose vitamin C. You can, you can work on your nutrition. There's something called MMS that they used for 100 years to purify water. And if you Google the... Uh, Africa and the Red Cross with malaria, you'll see that they cured malaria overnight in over 140 people by drinking this. It's something that kills virus and bacteria like the colloidal silver. So there are interventions that people can be using. And I think that the city should really look at some of those because to tell someone go home and quarantine for two weeks is scary. To tell someone you can spray your throat with colloidal silver and stay at home, that's different. I also wanted to say, 
the idea of quarantine scary, but it might happen. And there's a really positive approach to it. Instead of freaking people out, you could say, if you had the opportunity to stay home with your family and friends for two weeks, what would you do? Would you paint? Would you draw? Would you work on a novel? So there's positive ways to, to uh, work on people's mindset, which is what we'd like to do in this special edition, and if the city has any information that they would like to put out, we're very well read and we'd be interested in carrying your public service announcements. Well, thank you. I, I think, you know, why I wanted to be sure to stay till the end was to hear from other individuals who aren't associated with the city or government, quite frankly, because I know that sometimes um, the best ideas come from advocates and, and, and attorneys who have been doing this work for a long time. So I just want to thank you all uh, for your testimony. I am very disturbed by the xenophobic rhetoric that is out there, and, I, and I'm very sorry that um, any New Yorker or person has to go through that experience when we should be focusing on how to properly prepare, right? How to make sure that we're taking public health precautions. And, and the point of our hearing today was to hear from the administration so you could officially know what they're doing to prepare, but also to just send a very sober message that we have to prepare for the worst case scenario and to make sure that we're doing our best compared to other cities who are going through similar experiences. So I hope um, that some of the information today uh, brought some clarity and some support, and I just wanna, I wanna make sure that you all feel supported and that you feel resourced. And, it, and you've clearly said um, you could certainly use some more help, and I'll be sure to advocate and champion that and make could, sure that we do get through this together. Could I just say one short? Sure, of course, and then you, Mira. Most of my information comes after 5 o'clock. I get calls from middle-level staff people on every agency that works, people work for the city, the state, and the feds. Most of the time when there's a problem, the hearings, you hear from all the commissioners in the top level. I think you should, one of the things you should do the city council should do is improve the whistleblower law. Okay, there's a lot of people that are willing to come forward, and you should have me a phone, special number, that you can have people call up. That's very important. There's people that want to speak out and that can give you the information, you know, that's within those departments. And also, there's a lot I think you can get from the feds. There's different agencies also that could that, um, definitely help. And just one more thing on the roundup, the city, carved out an exception for golf courses, replacing all those golf course workers in harm's way by being allowed to be exposed to that thing without the protection that's necessary. And I think that's emblematic of how the city health department is not protecting those people or the workers out there. Understood. I just want to make sure today we were focusing on facts and what's the best thing to do, which is practice good habits as in flu season. And again, to make sure that we, we stick with how to take care of each other. And I guess, Mira, you wanted to add something? Yeah. Sorry, I always forget this. Um, been making uh, some very good efforts to sort of visit the Chinatowns, visit Flushing, say dine in Chinatown, those kinds of efforts. But I don't think they are enough. And I would very much like the city to think about the economic impacts and what these families and small business workers are going through in Flushing. Uh, and in all the various other chi Chinatowns, we've heard from Sunset Park, you know, we've um, from Canal Street, all these different places. And it's actually spreading now to beyond these Chinatowns to even just like restaurants even down in Wall Street where people are avoiding restaurants that are vaguely Asian, like, you know, Japanese people or Korean people. So um, I would very much like that the city council think about ways to somehow bring business back and help these people maybe, you know, say that there's some money, you can give them some money to sort of like a 0% insurance to tide them over uh, this time, <coughs> something like that. You know. Well, we'll certainly uh, discuss every option to make sure that families and small businesses feel uh, supported um, you know, again, today was to highlight facts to make sure that the information we were providing was rooted in facts and science. And um, and thank you so much for, for all of your testimony. I really do appreciate it. And um, thank you. Thank you for staying with us to the end. Okay. Thank you so much.
And uh, seeing no other members of the public that wish to testify, we'll adjourn this hearing.